Okay. Okay. Um, let me welcome each and every one. First of all, thank you to to Julie and team Bai and Ellen and others who basically uh, coordinate this particular um, program. And of course, especially for Professor Ngom, having sort of brought me on board also to be a contributor. Of course, today I'm just chairing this particular session with my other colleagues who also contributed. And we have a panel of six. And um, we, because of time, we will we'll try to sort of keep to the uh, time frame as such. We will allow each one more or less, like uh, Professor Falola had done yesterday, be sort of generous in giving 20. But of course, if we um, we hope each one can just stick to the 20 minutes because I think uh, we would like to leave it open for question and answers. We'll consider whether we will maybe just open for a few questions after the first three, but let's sort of uh, see how it goes. Let's start with uh, Professor Aaron. Um, styles so we have been together in another project so uh, let me quickly just uh, introduce her of course she's an associate professor in department of anthropology at university of nevada where she directs the graduate program and chairs the interdisciplinary minor program in religious studies the research focus on the intersections of religion law and gender and she has conducted ethnographic research on material disputes and islamic law in zanzibar and on religious experience in Northern Utah. She's the author of An Islamic Court in Context, an ethnographic study of judicial reasoning, as well as co and co-editor of Gendered Lives in the Western Indian Ocean. Professor Stiles, we'll hand over to you now in uh, 20 minutes. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's nice to, nice to see you. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I am on the west coast of the US, and so it is extremely early in the morning. So <laughs> I'm drinking coffee while presenting. Um, let me share my screen. Let's see. That, everybody can see that OK? Yeah, that's fine. OK. Maybe you can just enlarge it. Yes. All right, how's that? It's okay? Okay. Okay. Um, all right, well, I am delighted to be here and enjoyed the session yesterday, and I'm really looking forward to today. So um, for my presentation, I'm doing uh, just kind of an overview of what I covered in my chapter, Sharia Law in Muslim Africa, um, focusing, and I'll focus for the, present, the purposes of the presentation in the interest of time, I'll focus mostly on what I um, what the chapter covers about the the contemporary period, of course, as as noted in my nice introduction, I'm an anthropologist, so um, that is my that is my that is my area of focus. So um, and I did tr I tried to I tried to stick roughly to the to the guidelines in terms of how to how to organize the the presentation. So all right, oops, hang on, let me advance my slides. All right, so I divided my chapter into three general areas. Um, the first the first two are shorter, of course, again, since I'm an anthropologist focusing on the contemporary period, um, I did spend a lot more time on section number three in the chapter. So uh, the first section of the chapter is sort of a general overview of, um, of the advent of Islam in Sharia and Africa in terms of what we know. Um, the second looks briefly at the, the, the changes wrought during the colonial period and then in the in the final section of the chapter I consider independence through the 21st up until the present day um, looking at Sharia in, in practice and in controversy in terms of certain kinds of debates over the constitutional status of Sharia so for for the presentation today again because in the interest of time um, I'm just going to focus on um, on mostly on part on part three and then I'll I'll conclude with some um, some suggestions. Well, <laughs> I'll conclude with noting some things that I did not put in the chapter that probably, I mean, would have would have been great to include. Um, and then I'll have some suggestions for for what I see as really promising directions for future research um, on the subject. So again, this is not this is a this is really as a lot of the, I think a lot of the chapters in our volume. Um, it's it's more of a survey rather than based on you know my original research. So I do incorporate a little bit of my 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 former research in Zanzibar into the chapter, and I'll talk I'll talk about that that a little bit a little bit toward the end. Um, 
All right. So in terms of my the key findings, again, looking primarily at the contemporary period, um, is certainly will come as a surprise to no one. There's a, been a long coexistence of Sharia with other legal ideas and orders throughout the continent. Um, and at present, we find that Islamic law is utilized in many African states, and of course, primarily for personal status matters, marriage, divorce, and inheritance. So a lot of a lot of um, a lot of what I'll talk about later uh, falls particularly into marriage and divorce issues. Um, of, there's certainly much variation today in how states how states recognize and apply Islamic law, whether states do, even if states don't formally recognize Sharia, Muslims throughout the continent are utilizing Sharia in particularly in, in, in matters of personal status law, as we'll discuss a little bit toward the end. Um, Many legal systems are informed by Islamic legal principles and sources, and some make institutions, uh, some make provisions for Islamic institutions like Qadi or Qadi courts in East Africa. Um, and certainly, many states uh, have grappled with Sharia vis a vis other issues, excuse me, issues of religious pluralism, the coexistence of multiple legal orders, and gender equity in personal status law. So, I'll talk a little bit about, I have examples. I mean, the chapter is not comprehensive. I can't cover everything, of course, but I do have examples of some of these issues um, throughout throughout the chapter, and then I'll touch on a couple of them, um, a few of them in the presentation today. Okay, so again, the three issues that um, I'll be focusing on well, I'm sorry, for, the, for the, the third section of the chapter, Independence of the 21st Century, um, I divided that Large, that's the longest section of the chapter, and I've divided into three. Um, There's three topics. There could have been more, certainly, but these are the three I chose to look at. So I discussed um, the status of Sharia in different African constitutions, and then I talked a little bit about family law reform and codification in states where that is relevant. And then finally, I talk about Sharia in practice, and this is where I draw on my own um, my own research in Zanzibar that I began a very long time ago, and. <laughs> um, and have, have picked up again recently in hopes that I can get back there soon when we're all able to travel again. All right. Okay. So in terms of this first section, um, looking at the contemporary period as in Sharia and African constitutions, my key questions or the key questions that I noted um, we're looking at how states differently incorporate Sharia, of course, or do not, and then the surrounding debates and controversies. And just as some example, and, and throughout the chapter, I did, um, I looked at, I tried to be, well, not super balanced. I think there's probably a lot of East Africa since that is where I work. Um, but I did try to, to, you know, keep a reasonable balance of different different parts of the continent. So, um, and just a few examples here, there could be more, but just for the purposes of, of you know, not taking up too much time in the presentation, um, just as some examples of the variation and how different constitutions incorporate or recognize Sharia or don't. Um, so Egypt's, uh, in Egypt, 1981 constitutional amendment notes Sharia as the major source of, of legislation. So it's specifically noted as the, the major source of legislation in that constitutional amendment. Um, in Morocco, the 1962 constitution established Islam as a state religion, but doesn't mention Islamic law. Um, Kenya and Zanzibar are kind of similar in terms of their constitutions. The 1962 constitution in Kenya established, specifically established Islamic courts. We'll talk about, amend, or we'll talk about the new constitution momentarily um, and some controversy surrounding the status of the courts in Kenya. And then Zanzibar, which is, um, of course, a semi-autonomous state of Tanzania uh, that has its its own constitution, uh, the 1984 constitution also established Islamic courts. So Kenya and, Kenya and Zanzibar, the status of Islamic law is really quite quite similar. Um, and of course, uh, oops, yeah, so as, in terms of examples of, um, of 
controversy surrounding the constitutional status of the courts. I, the chapter focuses on two. I focus on some debates in Nigeria over the status of the federal Sharia court and um, debates over criminal uh, penal law in northern states. I think a lot of people here could probably talk about that a lot more, <laughs> with a lot more knowledge than I could. So I'll focus. Um, the other example I give in that chapter is the recent constitutional conundrum in Kenya. Um, and so I'll talk uh, for the presentation. I'll use that as my example. So so um, Kenya, Kenya's well, all of the all of the cases are interesting and unique. In Kenya, um, the Muslim the Muslim population is a minority, of course. No state religion is established, but as you know, as I noted, the 1962 Constitution does establish um, Kali courts, and Kali Kali is a Swahili um, Swahili for term, uh, same as the Arabic term Qadi, um, established in the constitution since the 1960s. And um, in, 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 the recent, in the last decade, there has been some controversy surrounding the status of the court. The 22 constitution retained the courts, but it really generated a lot of controversy. The anthropologist Susan Hirsch has written about this. And um, so I'm drawing, uh, drawing on her on her work on this, she worked in the she worked in the um, did ethnographic research in linguistic anthropology in um, courts in Mombasa, um, <clears throat> and has maintained an interest certainly in the status of Islamic law in Kenya. And the controversy surrounded surrounded whether the courts should be retained in in the constitution. And opponents argued. Um, that this showed a preference for Islam in the constitution because so it was really the only mention, the only mention of, of religion in the constitution. But advocates argued that the Kenyan government was already heavily, and, and the running of the state was already heavily influenced by Christianity due to the, the Christian majority population. Um, and it just, it sparked, it sparked a lot, a lot, excuse me, sparked a lot of debate and controversy. Um, the courts ended up being retained. And one interesting aspect of that that Hirsch notes um, is that women's advocacy, women's advocacy groups in Kenya at first were, some of them were at first questioning this, questioning whether or not the, the Kadi court should be retained in the constitution because they were skeptical of whether or not the courts, skeptical of, of how women were faring in the courts, but they eventually supported the retention of the courts in the constitution. And this was based in part on um, Hirsch's research in, in, the coastal, in the coastal courts showing that women were often very successful in their um, in there and bringing suits to the courts. So the advocacy, women's advocacy groups eventually did support the retention of the courts in the, in the Kenyan constitution. Um, the second area of this, or the second topic that I'm looking at in this part of the chapter is a little bit at um, family law codes and family law reform in recent years. So the, the things that I'm looking at there with states that do have family law codes, how do they draw on Sharia? Um, and then what is the impact of codification and reform on local practice in communities and courts? And I think this is this is a really, I think this is a really interesting area of research. And there's there's certainly a lot, um, a lot more that could be done here. Um, as you know, I'm an anthropologist, so of course I advocate the importance of ethnographic work, but it does seem to be a really rich area. And the first the first example that I'll talk about um, is the Ethiopian example. And this is, again, there's very little research on this. Um, so promising, certainly a promising area for future work. I was actually, about 10 years ago, I had planned um, to start a new project in Ethiopia um, on this, on, on, on the subject that I'm you know, I have here on the slide, but then I, I had a baby and so I did it. So that project has been on hold for, for 11 years now. I don't know if I'm ever going to return to it, but um, anyhow. So yeah, so this is, this is just an example of um, really promising area for study. Um, the Ethiopian Civil Law Code in 1960, um, for example, prohibited polygyny and divorce unless it was ordered by a judge. And so unsurprisingly, this was in conflict with a lot of local interpretations of Islamic law in terms of how people were using Sharia in order to, in, to regulate their um, um, marriage lives and, um, and other aspects of personal status. Um, but in terms of actual legal practice, it's certainly possible that the civil code didn't have much effect, uh, didn't have much effect at the local level. Um, also, there's a unified family code from 2000. Um, the limited research available suggests that it's, it's not 
typically utilized in Islamic courts in, in Ethiopia. So I think this is um, could be a really interesting area for research in terms of how the, the extent to which these um, these state level uh, law codes are impacting marriage and divorce practice at the local level. Another area, another really interesting area of research, there have been, <laughs> well, in an area where there has been a lot of research concerns um, um, divorce reform in an effort to make uh, divorce laws more equitable or divorce opportunities more equitable for women and men. And probably the, the, the case that has been studied the most is the case of reform of Hola divorce in Egypt um, at the beginning of the century. So this was, um, this, was, uh, this was an attempt by the Egyptian parliament to make uh, women's options in divorce a bit more, um, a bit more equ equitable, and so hula, which is um, one one of several types of Islamic divorce, is it's often often it's often termed in English as divorce by mutual consent. Some people informally call it a woman a woman's divorce, though I've been I've debated with some other scholars about whether that's an appropriate way of characterizing it. But what the Egyptian Parliament did was um, was made hula available to women. Um, women could initiate it without cause. So it's an effective no fault divorce and could be granted hula by judges without the consent of their husbands. Um, and this was, again, the effort was to improve gender equity and divorce. And this was, that ended up being quite controversial um, for a number of reasons. Some, some were arguing that this was, in, this was in conflict with classical Sharia or how hula was understood and it should be understood. Um, in, in quote unquote classical law. Um, others argue that this would lead to the breakdown of the Egyptian family. Um, a number of scholars have looked at this um, and found that it has, been, it has been pretty beneficial for women in terms, of, in terms of them getting the ability to obtain a divorce in, um, with, with less expense and with less time spent um, going back and forth and having things drawn out in the, in the legal process. So Algeria followed suit. One thing that's, um, one thing that is important, well, I'll, maybe I'll say this toward the conclusion, but that's been, anyhow, that's been a promising area of, um, of, of research in terms of, of looking at the effect of this um, state level reform on, on, um, on people's options in, 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 in divorce at the local level. Um, let's see. The third area, the third area of the chapter, um, sorry, distract, I was just distracted by the entrance of, hang on a second. I'm having a problem with my screen. Okay. Um, well, I can't see my all of my screen, but hopefully you all can. So the third area of the chapter, I draw a bit on my own research um, in Zanzibar, just to look at Sharia in practice. Um, a few of us, uh, <clears throat> a few of us have done ethnographic studies of 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 how people are utilizing um, utilizing Islamic law in their day to day lives, and there's um, some really promising new research um, that didn't make it into this chapter, but I'll talk about in uh, in 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 terms of directions for new research. But I um, I started working in Islamic courts, Qadi courts in Zanzibar for my dissertation research, which seems like a million years ago, but I guess it was about twenty years ago, and so um, in Zanzibar. Uh, is, is, is again similar to the status of Kenyan courts in that the courts are established by the constitution. Um, so there are, Zanzibar has got about 10, 10 uh, primary level Qadi courts, which handle all matters of personal status law for Muslims. Um, and so I spent a, long, a lot of time doing research in the court at, um, and this is my, I give a shout out to my husband who made this map. So I at one point did not acknowledge him for, <laughs> for his skill in making the map. So now I always need to do that. But so this is a map he made of the islands of, of Zanzibar. And this is, so Mkokotoni is a fishing village right here on the Northern part of the island. And so this is where I did a lot of research in the past in terms of the everyday practice of the Kali's court there. Um, and this is this photo up here is just of one of the colleagues I've worked with and some litigants bringing a, a case um, a case for it. And oops, sorry, ah, didn't mean to do that. 
where's my slide? Hang on. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, and so what I found in my work, um, well, similar to Susan Hirsch and her work in Kenya, not far away, is that women tend to bring far more cases to court than men. The vast majority of cases are brought by women. Most the slight majority of those cases are women seeking maintenance in marriage um, and then divorce cases are, or claims for divorce uh, or filings for the divorce of the second largest group there. And of course, the reason, one of the reasons for this is that men maintain the right to unilateral divorce outside of courts, so don't need to need, need to um, recourse to a court or to a kadi to obtain a divorce. Um, and women tend to be tend to be fairly successful as in, you know, as in Kenya and as in lots of Islamic courts around the world, a lot of scholars who have, have studied them tend to find that women are tend to be quite successful in bringing their claims forward. Um, one of the things that I've talked about in my research is whether or not, you know, when people win a case, is it really is it really winning? I mean, a lot of times women do seek, do get what they sought in court. However, sometimes it can come at um, a significant financial cost. But anyhow, but yeah, but women do tend to bring most of the case, most of the cases to courts. Um, when men bring cases to court, it's usually <clears throat> Excuse me. It's usually because um, it's usually be it's usually because of a, a a a woman a wife has left has has left the the marital home. Um, and one of the things I've found in Zanzibar, at least, that people tend to regard um, the kadi as really the last step in a in a three step process of resolving resolving disputes, um, marital disputes primarily. Again, the vast majority of cases that are coming to the courts are marital disputes. Um, first, of course, people will attempt to resolve matters with the elders of the family. And then the second step in Zanzibar is um, approaching the Sheha, which is a um, today is a government appointed community leader. And then the third step is um, if that if neither of those manage to resolve the dispute is taking the case to the um, to the Cadiz courts. Um, and I think one one of the things that that has come out of ethnographic research on the court that I think is really important and interesting is well, an additional thing I should say is that just really it shows that that what is what is recorded in the documents of the courts producing is often really different from what happens in the court. And so that's something that I've looked at in my research. And I always like to emphasize that, you know, when you're doing ethnographic studies of these disputes that are being processed in these um, in Islamic courts, you know, the process of creating a document is really is a lot that goes into it. And the document tells a story, but it's often it's often a very it's often a different story from what is actually playing out in the life of the court and one of one really good example of this is one of the very few child custody cases i ever studied um a woman had come to court and she you know she and her husband had divorced and they had several children and she was um she was she was destitute she was very poor she didn't have the means to support the children but they were still living with her and she came to court asking the kadi to make her husband take custody of the children. And so the Kadi and the clerks were discussing this and discussing this with her. And the Kadi was saying, well, this isn't a case. You can't sue for someone else to take custody of your children. Somebody has to sue for custody of the children. And so what they ended up doing was they ended up um, contacting her former husband and his sister, his older sister, and convincing them to <laughs> convinced well and they, they brought them in and they talked about the case and what they ended up doing was they opened the case on behalf of the ex the former husband and his sister as if they were suing for custody and then they were you know the 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 hearings played out and eventually the Kavi gave custody to the to the ex-husband the father of the children and his sister and so if you look at the court documents what's happening you know you see that you open the case file and it says Buana so-and-so is coming to court to suing to sue for custody of his children that he had with his former wife, Bibi so-and-so. And then, you know, there's some notes and then the decision is that the that the husband is granted custody when um, when that wasn't what happened at all. The woman came in asking her husband, asking the court to, to require her husband to take custody of the children because they were living with her. And of course, you know, he was, he was 
supposed to be supporting them. He wasn't doing that, but she really wanted them to live with him because there just wasn't, she had a very tiny little home and there really wasn't room for the whole family. But so anyhow, I think one of the, one of the really interesting uh, or important aspects of doing ethnographic research is, especially in an interdisciplinary group like this one, it's important to emphasize that this is a way of showing how these, how, what goes into the protection of these, of these documents that then get. Um, Hello, oh, the question or just a, all right. Um, okay, and then one of my other conclusions, uh, based on based on this long term research that I that I did in these courts, is that um, what I found is that judicial reasoning processes tend to be very very pragmatic and draw on multiple legally relevant ideas. Of course, drawing on the sacred source of Islam and the Shaf in 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 you know in Zanzibar and the Shafi tradition, um, but also drawing on local norms. Also, sometimes drawing drawing on state procedural law um, when relevant. And um, and I mean the Qadis that I've worked with, I've worked with one extensively, two quite a bit, and then you know interviews and kind of casual conversations with some others, they do tend to differ in terms of how they view their legal practice. And, um, but, but most tend to, tend to emphasize the pragmatic nature of what they're doing and the, and the, and, and, and the problem solving nature of what they're doing. That Kadi with whom I work most would always refer to the court as a hospital. And that this is where people, when you're, you know, when you're physically sick, you go to the clinic or the hospital and you get medicine and you get treated. And when you're, you know, in your personal life is, is, is <laughs> you're sick in your personal life, you come to the court and, and I try to heal that 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 marriage, for example. All right. So the last thing I want to do, I'm just just about wrapping up here. Um, just wanted to talk about some interesting new directions that I see for research on um, on Tree in Africa today. And again, I'm an anthropologist, so I'm focusing primarily on the kind of research that I see anthropologists and other socio-legal scholars doing right now. And just see a couple of them. I don't know if I think Falera was here yesterday. I don't know if Fatima is here, but I wanted to, to, to draw attention to some really interesting um, work that um, some scholars are doing right now that didn't that I didn't cover in the chapter, but um, I'm going to talk about it right now. So certainly, um, I feel like there's a there's certainly a necessity for more research on the practice of Islamic law throughout Africa, um, and this including outside of state institutions. So you know, just talking about my own research, I work in a context where Islamic courts, the Qadi courts are part of the state legal system. And, but, but, you know, in many places, um, it, there are many places where Islamic law is either recognized by the state in different ways or is not, yet Muslims are still seeking to resolve marital disputes, for example, inheritance disputes in accord with Islamic law. And so I think there's really certainly a need for more research on how Muslims are utilizing Sharia in practice every day, even outside of state institutions. And I think... Um, yeah, and I think that there's two scholars that I've worked with recently on a, an, an edited book on Islamic divorce in the 21st century are Falera Sakatori and Fatima Asap. Um, I wanted to just draw attention to some of the work that they're doing that is that is that I think is really important and is is um, is is doing exactly this. So um, Asaka Tori's work in Ghana is really fascinating. She's looking at marital dispute processing in a, in, among Muslims of, in Accra and one of the um, where where there isn't a, a formal state option for the handling of Islamic disputes, but she's looking at how the interplay, one of the fascinating things that she's doing is looking at the interplay of lay and expert interpretations and utilizations of Islamic legal ideas and how divorce and what a, what constitutes a an appropriate Islamic divorce is understood in these contexts and how, say, lay interpretations of appropriate divorce is influencing, um, is influencing in this very, interesting interactional way the way in which islamic experts are um who are, are advising and are sought out in the context of marital disputes are, are in, influencing the way in which their understanding and 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 um, thinking through divorce. So I think her work is really really fascinating. Um, also, Fatima Asab's work in South Africa is um, a really wonderful example of looking at um, kind of similar yet different, but looking at how Muslims are accessing um, Muslim judicial councils, for example, in a state that doesn't recognize um, Islamic marriage and divorce officially. And so Asab has, um, both, both Isaka Torre and Asab have wrote, written chapters for this book on um, Islamic divorce in the 21st century. And Asab's chapter is taking um, really 
fascinating chapter based on um, ethnographic and other kinds of research. And she is, she is making recommendations for South African state to formally recognize Islamic, uh, Islamic <clears throat> marriage and, and divorce in an effort to improve women, particularly women's options in, 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 in marital status and in, in, in resolving marital issues. Um, because in her research has found that women who are utilizing the Muslim judicial councils of various kinds and the, the Sharia courts and those are, are tend to not be satisfied with, with the resolutions that they're getting there. Um, another Sorry, our, our time is, is gone. We're done. Okay, that's fine. This is, all right. And so then I just want one, I'll just, I can have 30 seconds left. I'll just say that one, um, one thing, the direction that I am going um, when I, I took a break from Zanzibar for a long time and worked on a project that has nothing to do with Sharia in, in Utah, but um, I've begun a new, well, two summers ago now, I guess I started a new project, but I haven't been able to get back yet, of course, because of our global pandemic crisis. But um, one of the, when I finally get back to Zanzibar, I'm going to be considering um, inheritance disputes in everyday life and how people are navigating um, understandings of Islamic uh, rules of inheritance vis-a-vis gender dynamics, family dynamics, and competing sources of norms. So I'm excited about doing that project. So, all right, I think I'm done. I'll stop my share. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, extremely interesting sort of area that you have been exploring. And of course, coming from South Africa, I know Fatma Isop herself has been doing quite a bit of work and so have others uh, as well. But I think, uh, I mean, there are so many questions and so many areas to, to explore, but let's leave that for now. I'm sure some of our, our members on the panel here would also want to sort of raise questions pertaining to your paper. Let's sort of get to our uh, next panelist. Um, we are, are referring you to Professor uh, Britta Frede, who is a specialist uh, in Islamic studies, focusing on social transformation, translocal connectivities, and Islam in Africa since 1800, the PhD from the Free University of Berlin, basically dealt with the history of the Tijaniya in Mauritania, especially the implementation of the revival movement among the well-established local Tijani elite. The work has received, has received basically two awards, the Hedwig Hinze Women's Scholars Prize in 2013, and subsequently then the Anna Marie Schimmel Prize in 2015. Since 2012, focus shifted to female Islamic scholars in contemporary urban settings of Africa, especially Nouakchott in Mombasa and Cape Town. She currently holds position at Bayreuth University in Germany uh, in the research cluster on Africa Multiple. So we hand over to you, Freda. And uh, thank you very um, much for this kind introduction. Um, just a moment. Ah, oh, here. I will share my screen with you. Um, So I hope it is visible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So first of all, I would like to thank the editors for considering me to participate in this handbook on Islam in Africa and for organizing this event yesterday and today that allowed to discuss about the broad range of issues that are bound together to represent Islam in Africa as a research field. I will elaborate today a little bit about some of the thoughts behind the making of my chapter, Female Muslim Scholars in Africa. I'm since 2012 working on female Islamic scholarship in Africa, mainly in Mauritania's Islamic educational institutions known as Mahdara. While Islamic scholarship is associated with mainly male spheres, this chapter tries to sketch the contributions of women to the field of Islamic knowledge production. This contribution has remained a side note in most of the research done about Islamic scholarship in Africa, and a lot of irritating presumptions about the role of women in Islam in Africa have been published, especially during the 20th century. When I read this literature as a student, I was always a bit confused. How can a religion establish in a society if women are not allowed to participate within to make this argument more evident, I would like to narrate a brief encounter during my PhD research. When I was exploring the history of the Tijaniya in Mauritania, I decided to write about the Niasi renewal during the 20th century 
and to explore the entanglement of colonial modernity and religious transformation in a during this time still mainly nomadic environment. The only detailed work done on this Nyasi renewal in that area in this, this time was a conference paper of a PhD student in the late 1990s who had started a thesis on exactly this movement, but due to personal reasons could never finalize it. She had stated that the Nyasi renewal allowed women more participation in the Sufi movement in contrast to the classical teacher Nia that following her argument did not even allow women to receive the litany, the weird, that is at the core of the Tijani Sufi path. This statement made me doubt. Not surprisingly, I found many women from this classical Tijaniya in that region who were spiritual guides and who for sure had received the word when they entered the Sufi path. I'm sure if she could have continued her research, she would have found out herself. But at the early stage of her own research, she became tracked in the top point of colonial literature. Before I now want to elaborate a bit more on the topic of female Muslim scholars in Islamic Africa, I want to invite you to a short side trip into the Ural region in today, Russia, during the last ice age, some 11,500 years ago. What you see here is the Shiger statue, a wooden sculpture found in the Eastern Ural that made headlines during March this year in international newspapers. This statue was already found during the later 19th century and was dated in the 20th century as being 9,500 years old. This age already made our colleges astonished, but by now, thanks to new technology, the statue was dated even older, namely 11,500 11, years old. Clearly, this statue originates to the period of the later Ice Age and is the product of a hunter-gatherer community, a type of society that nobody thought of to produce such a filigrant piece of art that hints at the complexity of this particular culture. Such a complexity was more associated with Egyptian pyramids or the city-states of Mesopotamia, both of a much younger age but a hunter-gatherer society was thought of having a less complex cultural production well in a time and region where wood was mainly used to produce artifacts the cultural traces of such early historical times have already disappeared that is just evident due to natural processes but what this example tells us is that we should remain cautious while doing our research and be aware of this principal rule that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Or to put it, put it a little bit more simply, if you can't find something, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It has not always to be wood that cultural products disappear over time. Sometimes we do not see things due to research paradigms or due to other reasons of lack of sources. So to remain a bit with this figure statue that is undoubtedly a very beautiful and impressive artifact documenting a time about which we might never know more than some bits and pieces, I want to ask in our case, what transformed female Islamic scholarship into a wooden artifact? Here we need to think about a variety of factors. One is of course the rare documentation in sources. We could conclude that first female Islamic scholars are rarely mentioned in these sources. Second, the type of sources are not very beloved by classical historians. We find biographical literature and travelogues. Both types of sources have often been classified as repetitive and with little information as many topoi are involved in these writings. Further, poetry as a source is often ignored. The same is true for our accounts. They have been accepted late in historical historiographical writings. Finally, Tom's, for example, could tell us stories about women scholars as well, but they have not been sufficiently documented in the African context. One reason might be that Tom veneration is seen as an ambivalent practice of so-called popular Islam, whatever this popular Islam might be. And with this, we are already involved with the research paradigms that have contributed to the forgetting of female contributions to the realm of Islamic knowledge production. We find something that I call a colonial perspective 
the interest in powerful big figures of Islamic scholarship, personalities that are normally male and represent a religious movement that has impact and influence. Such a research interest is following the political influence of religion, something that during colonial times, of course, was mostly relevant. The colonial power gathered knowledge about Islam in Africa because they wanted to secure their control over the colonized subjects. They were not interested in the intellectual or cultural production of Islam in Africa. A second research paradigm turns out to be problematic when tracing female Islamic scholarship, and this is the focus on relevant texts. Such relevance is measured by the fact that these texts are cited among the erudite, normally male scholars. Such a focus leads to the ignorance of scholars of the second rank. So I mean with that scholar who are more of an average level of knowledge, but might have nevertheless substantially contributed to the intellectual production of Islamic knowledge, and for and foremost have contributed substantially to the spread and sustaining of the Islamic religion on the continent. It is not the big scholar alone who establishes a religion. And it is not the high esteem of intellectual scholarly production that allows a religion to consolidate its influence in a society. But I, by ignoring the less outstanding scholars and authorities, we overlook the contributions of women as they were mainly not to be found in the outstanding representative positions. They were further often not producing a lot of written texts something they share with many male scholars who are not at the forefront of Islamic scholarship. Islamic scholarship is not only producing a written heritage, but an oral heritage as well. The focus on written sources again marginalize the memory of female Islamic scholars. The last element that transforms female scholars into the wooden artifact is the gendered notion of modesty. I mean, with that, that Islamic scholars for a long time, and some still do today, follow a certain role model in their behavior. One of these qualities is, and we can learn that very well when looking at the biographical literature, to be modest. Such a modesty among women obviously looks different than by men. I interview women who did even deny their in engagement in Islamic scholarship. They did not want to talk about as an emphasis of their modesty. This is very different with men. During my interviews I made, I have not met a man denying these contributions to Islamic scholarship. All these elements produce an obstacle to come to a conclusion how the contribution of women to the realm of Islamic scholarship looks like. It is like prehistorical wooden artifacts. The traces of their engagement disappear over time and become hidden. Still, I hesitate to conclude from this little bits and pieces of female Islamic scholarship that their contribution was or is marginal. The questions I think we should ask ourselves is, what do we mean when we talk about Islamic scholarship? I think the reflection on female Muslim scholars and the difficulties to track their impact is inviting us to revisit our ideas about notions of Islamic scholarship. We need to think about whom we mean when we are talking about Islamic scholars. What are the attributes that make somebody an Islamic scholar? And is the category of an Islamic scholar stable? Or isn't it more the case that this idea transforms over time as well as the text production transforms? Further, we need to constantly keep in mind that Islamic scholarship is not exclusively a written heritage. The opposite, the oral and the written remain in a certain tension, and the oral part is especially important when we think about the broader Islamic communities. You don't become Muslim by reading scholarly texts. So what is the role of a Muslim scholar for the religion? An important question is as well how this interchange of the so-called lived Islam and the scholarly Islam is taking place. Is lived Islam to be understood as being exclusively oral and the scholarly Islam exclusively written? A final question that I would like to throw here in the audience is what creative text production means in Islamic scholarship 
and how does authority play into the process of text production? All these questions do not exclusively concern female scholarship, but they are questions that if explored deeper, could help to shed light on the impact of female Muslim scholars. What I did in this chapter was that I tried to sum up the state of the art while having these critical questions that I just lined out in mind. So I sketched over the source issue and obstacles of research paradigms, but I even emphasized that the visibility of women is not stable. We see periods of invisibility and periods of visibility. The visibility is especially obvious in founding periods of reform or renewal movements. We can then see that women do have religious agency, and this is visible in a bunch of diverse actions. Often we find them mentioned in their role of assisting male leaders in the fields of education, especially children and women, but sometimes even male scholars. Further, their efforts in care work understood in a broader sense. It is sometimes mentioned that women guard certain texts or they provide food or take over responsibilities in the scholars' trade activities. That is an important basis for Islamic scholarship, especially in pre-colonial times, as it secures the material basis for Islamic scholarship. However, sometimes female religious agency goes far beyond these activities and concerns spiritual guidance or even tax production. In Mauritania, I found several manuscripts from the 19th century that were written by female scholars, and I bet in other manuscript collections, such manuscripts can be found as well. However, such manuscripts often do not mention the name of the author and are obviously not of that kind that they are cited or even copied. The manuscripts I saw were mainly autographs. They remained in the family's collection. Of course, it is difficult to make a generalizing argument from such findings. This is again like the wooden statue of, from the Ural. It just hints at an existing of a cultural phenomenon, but it leaves us with many open questions, especially when reflecting about impact. The structure of my chapter tries to illustrate that like male Islamic scholarship as well, female Islamic scholarship transformed as society and their understanding of knowledge has transformed as well. So we find in the sources, the mentioning of classical erudites and miracle makers from early Islamic times in the 18th and then especially during the 19th century, Sufi movements are an environment where we find many mentions about female authorities and female Islamic scholars. Finally, educational reforms on the African continent have produced a new type of Muslim scholar, what some researchers have labeled with reference to Gramsci as the organic intellectual. Here we do, of course, find the beginning of feminist Islamic scholarship as well, a field in which naturally women are dominant. I would like to conclude with the mentioning of two research gaps that are most prominent when it comes to the literature about female Muslim scholars. And again, I would say that these gaps are not exclusively concerning female Islamic scholarship in Africa, but Islamic scholarship in general. First, we are still lacking a systematic documentation on historical sources hinting at Islamic female scholarship in Africa. Further, there is little to no engagement with the texts written by female scholars, especially the ones from older days. Contemporary writings have experienced more attention, but the older texts are still mainly not read and put into context. Thank you very much for uh, your thanks attention. For, yeah, thanks for your presentation. I think the, the topic itself uh, is fascinating because a little research has been done. Uh, I mean, they have some, like yourself, who have been exploring these areas, but I think it's, it's an area that needs further exploration. And particularly when one also looks at, apart from Muslim female scholarship, we're also looking at Muslim female activists uh, who might not have been scholars, but they have been very critical in terms of um, contributing towards the transformation of their, uh, their communities and groupings. Thanks very much. Let's move on to the uh, next uh, presenter. And she is Claire Sulji. I'm not certain whether I pronounce it correctly, uh, Claire. Lim 
is a PhD candidate in political science at Boston. She received a, a BA in international relations with a minor in English literature and an MA in international cooperation at the Graduate School of International Studies, both at Seoul National University. She focused on African studies, international relations, women's political participation, women's movements, uh, civil society, religion, and feminism. Her graduate work has focused on the consequence of the gender parity law in Senegal and in terms of social changes and within the broader conversation of African feminism and civil society. Having said that, let me hand over to you, um, Claire. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, so nice to have to be in this uh, panel and uh, I will forever be thankful to, of course, Professor Ngon for including me in the um, in this book, uh, which uh, I have as my uh, most one of my most prized possessions at home. Um, uh, my name is uh, Sylvia Lim. Uh, I also Claire, and I am uh, I I graduated thankfully <laughs> uh, yeah uh, last year, and I'm currently a, an assistant professor in politics at Bates College in Maine. Um, I don't have slides, uh, so I'll just do my presentation orally. I uh, actually did not know <laughs> that people were preparing slides. Um, I also would like to apologize in advance. I didn't calculate. Um, the time correctly and I have a family obligation and I have to leave at the latest 10.30, but I'll definitely stick around. Um, so I would like to go over um, some of the uh, content of the chapter. I still remember trying to put the finishing touches uh, while I was doing my field work uh, in Senegal few years ago. Um, so the purpose of uh, this chapter was to try to see the um, relationship between politics and religions, more specifically Islam. And um, in my uh, in trying to find the puzzle, I often thought that most research, or at least most people think about the relationship between Islam and politics as in, is Islam beneficial for democracy or is um, Islam conducive to democ uh, a democ democratic regime. And I wanted to go a little bit beyond and perhaps even more in depth into that and trying to figure out some of the nuances of not necessarily religion impeding or allowing a certain types of political regime, but rather the intricacies of finding religious elements within the political lives of uh, certain Western African countries. And because my research was mostly in Senegal, I wanted to do a more comparative research for this chapter. And so I chose Mali uh, for a number of reasons for the similar um, colonial history under the French uh, administration, as well as the prevalence of religion within those two countries. I also chose them because the end, quote unquote, the end result of what we see currently in uh, both Mali and Senegal do present um, quite significant differences and I wanted to get at knowing why. And uh, I will confess that I did most of my research in Senegal and I am more familiar with uh, the Senegalese, um, uh, with literature and scholarship and uh, uh, kind of life in general in Senegal and Mali is definitely an area that I have not quite explored as much as I would like to. And this is something that I would definitely look forward to doing uh, once traveling is uh, becomes uh, safer. And so I try to, uh, in this chapter, I try to eliminate some of these uh, political relationship with Islam in uh, Mali and Senegal. And um, in my chapter, I go over some of the his history of the arrival of Islam in uh, on the continent, which I'm sure uh, is no news, uh, no new knowledge to everyone uh, here on this panel and uh, for the contributors of the book. And I try to find out why, uh, how Islam is practiced not in the sense of people's everyday practices, but practiced in the sense of how it intertwined with the political apparatus during uh, the colonial uh, regime and afterwards. And um, both Mali and in Senegal, the French um, colonial administration found out, concluded that cooperating with uh, Islamic leaders, with Muslim leader, leaders in the region was more beneficial for their indirect administration uh, rather than uh, suppressing Islam as an quote unquote outside force in the perspective of the French administration, of course. Um, 
And so they do have uh, some sort of a social contract as uh, quoted by many uh, scholars in this uh, area, um, especially uh, Leonard Villalon uh, talks about the social contract between the Marabouts uh, in both Senegal and Mali with the French administral, uh, col colonial administration. And, um, and so they lead, I hate to use the, the word peaceful in terms, uh, in a context of colonization, but they managed to have a somewhat uh, unequal, certainly, uh, but a, some of a relation, a semblance of a relationship of, of indirect administration, of inequality, of, colon, uh, of colonialism uh, during that era. Um, what I noticed later on, however, is that um, while in Senegal, Islam exists as almost an omnipresence in many aspects of the political, economic, uh, and social and cultural life. Um, in Mali, I uh, noticed based on uh, what other research and on what other scholars have done uh, that it was often used as a um, counter element to some of the political elements necessary to build a new uh, country, a new government after colonialism. So for instance, with the presidents um, uh, Keita and uh, Traor, Musa Traoré, uh, they use religion, uh, especially Islam, being both uh, Muslim uh, themselves, they use them as almost a, an antithesis to the nationalism, to the nationalist movement and sentiment that they wanted to, and that they were looking for establishing in their new country after um, independence. And so instead of having those two elements, religion and politics in parallel with each other, uh, they almost see it as uh, sometimes a hindrance to the creation of a new nationalist um, movement and sentiment within the country. And especially with, um, with Keita, who really is trying to, to cultivate the nationalist movement and sentiment uh, right after independence, uh, Traoré to a lesser extent, uh, where he does allow some sort of a um, rejuvenescence of, of, of Islam during his presidency. And so although religion remains a significant element within Mali, I see it more of a personal approach to religion as more of a personal guidance in people's everyday lives. And even though to this uh, in current news, we talk about separatist Islamist movement in Mali and how uh, it has the national security of Mali has been threatened by Islamist separatist movement. The Tuareg separatist movement is not necessarily based on religious sentiments, but it has been a, a more of an ethnic conflict and more of a division that existed uh, prior to the surge of fundamentalist Islam. And so I kind of see the elements of how political leaders have used religion in the eras, uh, in the years right after independence, kind of influence how Islam is viewed by uh, everyday, by people in their everyday lives and by political leaders. Um, I argue that Senegal is quite the uh, different case where uh, even after independence, political leaders have actively used Islam as almost a companion, I would say, in their political endeavor, uh, in their nationalist endeavor. And so even with um, um, Leopold uh, Senghor, the very first president of, uh, of Senegal, even though he was Catholic, he very much uh, had the respect of the Marabouts in, uh, in Senegal. And so I kind of see the relationship in Senegal, at least between Islam and, and, uh, and the political realm as not necessarily opposing or uh, contrasting, but rather as a almost an inevitable uh, presence within the political realm. And so I kind of delve into in the chapter uh, based on that. I kind of delve more into some of the gender aspects of Senegal and how women in Senegal have used and continue to use Islam as a not necessarily a fund fundamental piece in their in their movements, but again as an inevitable presence that kind of is there and that they need to deal with. Excuse me, uh, because of the significance that religion has in um, their ordinary lives, and this is something that I often try to convey to my students as to how Islam uh, should not just be treated as this 
terrorist force or as this force as, that is impeding gender equality or democracy, but to kind of make people see that we don't necessarily have to think about Islam as, uh, or religion for that matter, as something that is opposing to gender equality or uh, notions of democracy, but rather as something that people use at, to transform some of the dis- definitions and concepts and strategies in order to fit within the political slash uh, religious framework that they are living in. And so uh, in the third part of, uh, of my chapter, I delve into some of the women's movements in Senegal, which uh, has been and still is kind of the center and focus of my research, of my dissertation and of my uh, research. And so I try to argue that many of these women's movements, uh, especially in trying to pass the law uh, on gender parity at the National Assembly level, are not shunning Islam uh, because of this idea that perhaps uh, the Quran says men and women are different, et cetera, et cetera. But rather that they're trying to, uh, that they are actively uh, including religious leaders in their, in their marches, in their discussions, in their workshops. Uh, they are actively using passages of the Quran to tell uh, the perhaps more conservative political leaders that what they're trying to achieve, uh, political and economic parity, is not necessarily something that Islam is against, right? Uh, and uh, that they that they cite actively. Uh, I've been in my field work in Senegal. I've seen uh, renowned feminist scholars, uh, gender studies scholars, uh, use passages of the Quran to kind of support their work towards uh, gender parity, towards gender um, yes, gender parity and uh, advancement of of democracy. Uh, and I use the words gender parity um, on purpose because, again, uh, they don't necessarily, the women that I talked to in Senegal don't necessarily see the term gender equality uh, fit in their framework of how they see the quote unquote equality between men and women, where, again, parity is more of a mathematical um reality where to ha- to have 50% of the national assembly of parliamentarians be women be men and 50 50% uh, of them be women and that does not necessarily lead to the notions of gender equality that we perhaps in the western world use in terms of men equal women uh, and so many of the women that i've talked to don't necessarily aspire to to become religious uh, leaders or imams, uh, although they may be religious, unofficial religious leaders in their circles, in their neighborhoods, uh, which is something that uh, Professor Frieder just mentioned, which I found uh, fascinating in terms of being present in the creation of Islamic and Muslim knowledge, but not necessarily wanting to be at the forefront. Now, one may argue um, that this uh, propensity to not be at the forefront may also be pro- problematic in some way, but I view this as a almost a, uh, not necessarily a compromise, but a marriage of, of different values of, poli- of, on the one hand, political democratic values, and on the other hand, the social, cultural, religious values. And so uh, in the chapter, I tried to explore a little bit of how the 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 history of Islam uh, incorporated with colonial administration, with co- colonial history, and how it has been used uh, post independence to kind of show that women's movements have had more opportunities and uh, more of a chance to kind of grow and uh, delve with re- with religion in a more open manner, and uh, not and which is not necessarily which has not necessarily happened in in Mali, and some of the um, areas of improvement that I see for this chapter is definitely delving more into uh, the Malian K- case, uh, which, uh, like I said, I'm not familiar with, and I would um, definitely supplement uh, this chapter with actual field work in Mali, perhaps talking to some of the women's movements that exist in Mali, and um, and trying to have a more comparative lens and a more general lens of how Islam is practiced in many countries in, in Western Africa. Uh, Mauritania is definitely a country that uh, I would love uh, to include at some point. Um, I'm always 
just as a side note, I'm always uh, fascinated by people who study Mauritania um, because I grew up there and, uh, and nobody ever seems to study it. <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, so uh, I'm trying, I hope I'm not over time or at least uh, I'm not like giving too much, uh, have not left, left that much time. But uh, I definitely see this research something that I uh, am trying to pursue. Uh, hopefully by traveling back to Senegal and other countries uh, sometime next year uh, and, um, and kind of trying to always see the, the ways that women are using political and religious um, elements to advance the rights that they think uh, should be practiced according to their cultures and norms within uh, their countries and not necessarily, not necessarily following the kind of global feminine or the Western feminist movement um, elsewhere. And uh, yeah, thank you so much again for uh, having me here and I look forward to listening to all the other panels. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Tim. I think uh, again, it's, uh, uh, you, you touch on an area that if one does comparative study between Islam and politics in West Africa compared to what happens in East Africa compared to what happened in Southern Africa. I think there are lots of interesting variations and comparisons one can do. And more specifically pertaining to the women movements. I think the Muslim women movements have also been understudied. And I think there's a need to, to also do further research. I'm sure collaborative research work will be great uh, from your side and others. Uh, uh, in East Africa and in, uh, in, in South Africa. Um, I think let me sort of just change, uh, shift from the Sunnah that uh, Professor uh, um, did yesterday by instead of moving on to the next speakers, instead of speakers, let's uh, stick to our first three panelists. And um, if there are any urgent question, we'll sort of allow for about uh, 10 minutes uh, for, for questioning and then shift to uh, the next three uh, thereafter. So are there any one who would like to sort of ask a question? I hope I can see your hands if there are any hands, unless we move on. I'm sure if you sort of look at the three uh, papers, they sort of are sort of interconnected in sort of different ways that uh, because we can think about Muslim women and, and Sharia. In other words, their involvement also in the formulation and the application of uh, Sharia it, uh, itself. It we looks like the Muslim um, yeah. women's movement. Brian Maxey yeah, okay, has, yeah. has a question. Oh, wait, okay, Brian. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I didn't. Okay, Brian, over to oh, you. Yes, thank you. Good, good morning. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the wonderful talks this morning as well. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make it brief, uh, just so other folks can ask questions. Um, and just wanted to thank all the panelists. And just to, I forgot to introduce myself yesterday. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Um, first year, just finished the first year. So my question was just really quickly in relation, I guess in some ways to, to each of the, the talks, and thank you again for each of the professors for sharing. Um, and, and I would say it's particularly for Professor uh, Frida, um, just thinking to the really um, powerful question, the, provocation you get to your side you're gonna hear my son here <laughs> I just had a baby so I'm here alone with him um, so speaking on this concept of, of children I wanted to, to ask about the idea of, of mothers I'm thinking of the work Professor Freya that you've done with Joseph Hill and the way Sheikh Mariam and Na Nias frames mothers as scholars from the very beginning can you please thank you just come sit down for me sit down for me um, from the very beginning teach children and I'm thinking I can't think of a specific account but where there's some scholarly accounts even in documents where you go back into the records, but they're not necessarily saying this, my mother was my sheikh, but they'll say, I learned from my mother and from my father. And with that framework as a potential way of looking backwards for these models of uh, women's scholarship. And it also makes you think of the US or even in Europe and North America where elementary school education is kind of deprioritized or de-emphasized as like a model, but even though it's the foundation. So I'm just kind of thinking of, do we think of that as a frame or as a model for unearthing or recentering, whatever word we would use for women's scholarship as a, at the bedrock of all the other scholarship. Okay, um, let's, uh, uh, um, we'll come to uh, Dr. Rahina Mahalzu, please. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, 
Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity and uh, thanks uh, to the presenters. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Frida. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much and I've learned a lot. Um, so I have been thinking about the um, notion of uh, Muslim female scholars in West Africa. I work on female reciters of the Quran in Nigeria, my home country. And I have been uh, following and also part of, if I would say, the rising number of uh, female uh, preachers we witness every day. And I have been wondering whether, I mean, I want to hear your thoughts on that, whether the female um, scholars or preachers we have, I mean, how to ad address them. Do they fall, in your opinion, to the category of scholars or to category of uh, preachers, uh, considering, uh, for instance, the requirements of uh, alim or ulama on the uh, classical Islamic studies? Um, so I usually get confused on the right uh, term uh, or category to to address. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Muslim scholars or preachers we have. So I, I'm not sure I have put my question in, in the right way, but I, I would like to hear your thoughts on how to address them. Are they scholars? Are they preachers? Are they ulama? What do you think, please? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Professor Amidou, Sani? Yeah, so, yeah, thank you very much. Well, I, I have just two interventions or to make. Number one, the position of uh, the daughter of Sheikh Nayas in Senegal, uh, I, I hope she's still alive, has been a bit uh, dicey in the sense that being a woman and being a Sheikha, the acceptability by the men folk in a largely conservative society like ours in Africa is, I don't know how far that has improved. Has she been able to sustain that uh, reverence and acceptability among the men folk who are members of the Tijaniya order, and that is one. And of course, are there other examples of our type out there? The second one is that in Nigeria, for example, now you will see that uh, female child education seems to be in jeopardy due to the incessant attacks and kidnappings and things like that for the past uh, four or five years. Now, I do not know whether in either of uh, the presenters, either Fred, uh, Fred or the other person, if you think, can you think of any solutions that we made or proposal that could sustain this female education something in Nigeria or perhaps uh, create a sort of platform that could assist those who feel threatened by this uh, terrible uh, incident? Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, uh, Professor uh, Amido. Let us uh, come to our panelists. I think, um, Britta, uh, quite a few questions uh, have been posed to you in a sense of the yeah. two. So perhaps uh, ask me to respond first and then we'll get the response from... Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you very much for all your questions. Yes, of course, mothers uh, as scholars are mentioned um, uh, in a lot of biographical accounts. A lot of um, uh, sheikhs in West Africa um, refer to their mothers or their grandmothers or their female aunties. Um, um, as their first teachers. And I think um, that is uh, very well um, encountered. And then when you see, for example, among the Muslim brothers, so completely different um, strand, um, their argumentations why they want to train women is especially that, that they want them to be good mothers and to educate their children in the right way. So I think this idea is still very present till recent day and was always present. Um, yes, uh, Rahina, what is the difference between teaching and preaching? I think this is a very, very tricky question and it is not easy to respond to that. And um, I have this discussion since long with Hassan Zovo, who works on female preachers in Kenya. And I think we, um, it is very difficult. And I think I have tried to address that a little bit. What do we understand about uh, Islamic scholarship. Where is the border? Is it only the erudite, the really big numbers, the big uh, names um, who write very difficult treaties that can only be read by certain other people who have the same amount of knowledge? And what is about the ones in the second rank? 
um, that might be very pro prolific um, preachers, are they scholars or not? And I think it's worth to reflect about that and to discuss it, but I don't have a final response to that yet. Yeah, and then Sandy Omer, thank you for your question. Um, there is many examples like Mariam uh, Nias um, in West Africa. I, I have named a couple of them um, in the Mauritanian context in, um, in one of my publications. Um, the most uh, famous one might be the wife of Mohammed Al Hafiz. Um, who was then, when he passed away, um, said that she um, always then uh, spoke to him when she needed advice to guide the community. Even though she wasn't the official Khalifa of him, but she was one of the very, very important guidance um, within the Hafiziya um, 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 Tijaniya um, in this 19th century already. Um, and does female education help um, to, to um, I couldn't get exactly the whole um, question about the insurgency in northern Nigeria. I think, um, yes. Okay, um, I think that um, that the um, um, that a, a, a proper Islamic education can, of course, be helpful to um, uh, uh, to do something against um, this um, extremism and against these difficulties that arise from it. But I think um, that one has even to be cautious to not get to, into a discourse about what is good Islam and what is bad Islam in this context and, um, and be too strict about its definition. So I hope I got your question right. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bertha. Maybe we can get a response from Erin. Maybe her thoughts, Erin? Are you... Sorry, still muted. Um, yeah, sure. I'll weigh in a little bit. I think those are wonderful questions and it's, and the questions are, are drawing the three uh, papers together nicely, I think. I think where I would weigh in on this question, um, particularly the first question about uh, mother's scholarship and mother's teaching is, is in the strategies that I have seen women mm -hmm. use in the court. And I know that people have written about in terms of women seeking divorce or seeking marital maintenance elsewhere. I mean, regardless of whether they, you know, women are formally recognized, say, as prominent scholars in a particular community, women are always drawing on their um, drawing on their legal knowledge, their religious knowledge in strategizing in the way they're bringing disputes um, to courts or to other fora for, for resolving marital difficulties. And just a couple of examples, one case from quite, quite from, from my first research period in Zanzibar is this wonderful case, um, fascinating case, I should say, where um, <laughs> a, a husband and wife were disputing over whether or not a divorce had actually occurred. And the, the, the situation was that the, the woman said that her husband had divorced her through talak or talaka, a unilateral divorce outside of the court. And the husband said he hadn't. And the crux of the case was on the fact that the, the wife was much more highly educated than her husband. And she'd been serving as his sort of his, per, her, his personal religious instructor in the home. So she'd been giving him, um, she'd been giving him lessons in, 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 in Islam, various aspects of Islam. And so <laughs> the story happened that one night she asked him, it, according to the husband in the manner of a lesson, he, she said to him, well, do you know how a husband divorces his wife in Islam? And he said, no. And he, she's like, I will teach you. And she said, what you do is you get a piece of paper out and you write, I so-and-so divorce you so-and-so. And so he wrote it out and then she took the piece of paper. And then according to him, she turned around and left and said, thanks, now I'm divorced. And so she took off. And so, so what happened in the, in the case in the court was that, <laughs> that, you know, that the, the Qadi had to determine whether or not this, 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 he could uphold this as a legitimate divorce. And so his decision-making rested on intention. And so based on, you know, based on the woman's status as being someone who is, you know, quite relatively highly educated and much more highly educated than her husband, he decided that the intention to validate the divorce wasn't there because the husband really thought that she was giving him a lesson <laughs> in, in, in the, one of the mechanisms of divorce in the Islamic legal tradition. So I always thought that she was not happy with that decision at all, um, needless to say, but it was, um, but yeah, but uh, yeah, but you see, you know, women drawing on their extensive knowledge in order to strategize 
a favorable outcome in the court. One other thing that I've seen in the courts I worked in in Zanzibar is that the, the type of divorce I discussed earlier, hula, which is again, off, sometimes in the literature described as a divorce by women's prerogative. And then, you know, a lot of, a lot of contemporary states like Algeria, Egypt, Pakistan that have, have, have reformed at the state level, women's abilities in hula have framed it as, you know, this is, this is the option for women to seek divorce relatively easily, but in, in, in Zanzibar, there's no family law code and women almost, hula is used, hulu in Swahili is used a lot in the courts, but it's used by the the Qadis, not by people don't, women don't request it. And the reason being in, in Zanzibar, women don't tend to request hulu because it requires almost always her paying back her mahar, mahari, in its entirety or even more. And so it's 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 in 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 Swahili it's called kununua talaka to buy a divorce. So it's 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 not what women want to do. And they want a divorce, they want they want a talaka bure, they want a free divorce, which is usually fuss. And so in coming to court out of, I mean, I've looked at court records since the 80s and I had, um, I mean, I ha again, I haven't worked in Zanzibar and not on divorce for a while. So, you know, this is my, my, my data does not go up to the present day, but in, you know, the, the t the almost, I mean, I think out of something like 1200 cases in, in this one particular court, there was maybe two or three times that women were actually requesting Hulu because they, you know, see it as a, it's, 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 it's an, it's a, it's a non-preferred form of divorce because, um, because they'll usually have to, to buy it from their husband. So anyhow, so I guess I, my, my, my question is not necessarily in terms of or the way I'm responding to that is not, is looking at, you know, scholarship in terms of everyday practice and, 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 and women's religious knowledge and legal knowledge in terms of how they're strategizing um, through marital difficulties. So I'll stop. Thank thanks. Uh, Dr. Lim, you want to play? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Frieda and Dr. Stiles have already mentioned a lot of uh, fascinating uh, topic, but I just wanted to kind of add on to talk a little bit about some of the uh, usage of the lived experiences of women, uh, uh, especially when we when in my research of women's movements in Senegal, uh, people often, you know, question uh, how do they get to those movements? How do they organize themselves? And this is something that they have been doing uh, basically almost all of their uh, entire adult lives where organizing uh, in small neighborhoods, uh, in small villages to think about um, perhaps uh, getting each other credits and loans at, uh, at lower interest or um, talking to a local business uh, to kind of have their products at a lower price is something that they've always done in terms of organizing themselves. And so uh, definitely the lived experiences of women of uh, as mothers, as, as daughters, as sisters is something that is often neglected, I think, in scholarship, and yet is something very uh, significant in uh, the lives of these people. And that's something that should, I, sh I think, uh, be observed in, you know, in many different methods in the scholarship as well. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay, I think uh, let's uh, shift to the next uh, three presenters. Uh, our time is also moving. Uh, let's start with uh, Professor Christopher Wise, who is Professor of English and Comparative Literature. His research interests include Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, Niger, and Senegal. His recent book include A la Richard de la Yambo Oleguam, Sorcery, Totem, and Jihad in African Philosophy and archive of the Umerian Tijaniya. Wise has also edited and translated various books by African mm -hmm. writers, which includes uh, the Timbuktu Chronicles, uh, and of course, uh, a number of others. And is currently editing, translating the collected writings of Al-Hajj Sekou Tal. Professor Wise, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna be, forgive me for reading from a prepared script. I, to get it within the 15 minute uh, parameters, I, I uh, wrote it out so I would not go over. But I'm gonna start with uh, my methodology and sources. And um, I'd like to do this because my paper is more a concise reiteration of previous research uh, that I've conducted in Sahelian literatures but rethought in light of the events that have taken place in Mali between 2012 and 2013 during the rise and fall of Azawad. Uh, as a Fulbright professor at the University of Ouagadougou in 1996, I made the acquaintance of Professor Joseph Paré, who 
during a meeting of a Sahelian literature conference spoke of what he called Sahelite. Uh, Paré referred to the united and, or the unified and ancient culture of the Sahel long predating the coming of Islam and spoke of the need to develop regional studies rather than those based on post-colonial national boundaries that are from a cultural perspective relatively arbitrary. Upon further research, I found that Paré's hypothesis was echoed in the research of Thomas Hell and Paul Stoller, who similarly spoke of deep Sahelian culture. So for instance, one might say that it's not possible to understand Islam as a cultural phenomenon uh, in the Sahel divorced from indigenous beliefs that long predate it. However, it is quite possible to investigate West African belief systems with almost no reference to the Islamic religion. Uh, in Burkina Faso, Tatinga Frederic Passeri has extensively documented Masi beliefs in multiple publications. No reference to Islam is necessary in this case since until pretty recently, Islam played almost no role in Masi history other than as an external irritant. I've conducted much research based upon the validity of this hypothesis, the hypothesis of Sahelite, which I continue to affirm. When Wahhabi militants from Algeria, Libya, Libya, and elsewhere invaded Northern Mali and set about destroying the artifacts of Sahelian culture that they deemed heretical, such as the tombs of the saints and the manuscripts of Timbuktu, like many others, I was deeply upset. But I was also dismayed to see that in the West, the conflict was portrayed in strictly sectarian terms while ignoring the racist dimensions of the conflict. The events of 2012 and 2013 have caused me to reinvestigate notions like Sahelite and deep Sahelian culture, but in this case, to press them into the service of better understanding what is happening today, rather than as I've tended to do in the past, seek to understand the cultural and literary documents of the past. So in my paper, uh, or in my chap book chapter, I draw upon previous re uh, research, but more to investigate the present. So here's a summary of the research of my chapter. And again, I'm trying to keep this brief. Uh, so many dynamic West African figures throughout history have claimed that they militated in the name of true Islam. This includes Iskia Muhammad, Sekou Amadou, El Hajj Omar Tal, and so on. However, there is no interpretation of Islam in the West African setting that has rid itself of all vestiges of ancient Egypto-African religious belief. What is commonly denigrated as sorcery, animism, heathenism, and so on. Each diverse manifestation of the Islamic faith in the Sahelian context should instead be construed as a variation upon an indigenous Arab religion that has undergone Africanization or Ajamiization to cite Falou Nagom, who's with us today. In the West African setting, Arab Muslims have not succeeded in destroying indigenous religions. Instead, Islam has itself been transformed into multiple varieties. This is as true of Islam as practiced in the era of the Askiyas as it is uh, in the era of the Messina reformer Sekou Amadou, the Tijaniya militant El Hajj Omar Tal, the Sokoto Sultan Mohammed Bello, and many others. The fact remains that West Africa is under siege today by Wahhabi and Arab centric jihadists who have conducted numerous attacks upon indigenous black peoples who are not sympathetic to them. They are able to carry out such missions because Arab Islamic nations external to the region continue to support their efforts, even as many Arab Muslims in North Africa, the Gulf States and the Levant deny that racism exists in the Arab Islamic world. A thousand years after the arrival of Islam on the upper Niger Delta, African religious practices that have long been stigmatized as sorcery continue to provide cover for Arab imperialist ventures in West Africa. El Haj Omar Tal too dreamed of waging jihad against the people of Ouagadougou after he had already destroyed the Bambara in Segu, the Messina Fulani in Hamdalai, and many others. The Wahhabi jihadists who invaded Northern Mali in 2012 do not view El Hajj Omar Tal and his Tijaniya followers as Muslim brothers, but as heathen in need of conversion to true Islam. Tal himself was hardly a Wahhabi militant, but a Sufi of the Tijaniya order who engaged in religious practices that are rejected as heretical by Wahhabis. 
The extant chronicles of Tall's eventful life richly document many of these practices. Such practices include the swearing of oaths upon the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad, as practiced by El Hajj Omar Tall, the Eskia Muhammad, and many other religious leaders of the Sahel. To swear an oath upon the grave of an Islamic saint binds those who do so in a profound way, for one thereby promises to uphold a covenant with the dead as one's witness. The Tariq El Fatash enumerates the many blessings that are believed to be bestowed upon those who pray at the tombs of Timbuktu saints. In Timbuktu, the faithful have long prayed for rain at the tomb of El Hajj Mahmud Kati, one of the authors of the Tariq El Fatash. El Hajj Omar Tal was similarly, similarly credited by his followers with the ability to change the weather through the power of prayer. Across the Sahel, the vast majority of Muslims who belong to many different Sufi orders in the region continue to affirm practices that Arab Wahhabis reject as heretical and that are anticipated in the religious customs of the ancient Egyptians. Such practices include the oral consumption of surahs from the Quran inscribed upon paper after the ink is mixed with water and then drunk as an occulted elixir. Conjuration rites common in the Sahel among Sufi orders like the Tijaniya, the Kadriya and others hearken to religious practices that were common among the ancient Egyptians, the pre-Christian Gnostics and others. Other religious practices associated with sorcery, including circumcision, ritual cutting, amulet writing, the veneration of fetishes, animal metamorphosis and so on have prospered in the region for many centuries. The indigenous religious practices of Islamic Sufi orders in West Africa stand as bulwarks against the racist doctrines of Wahhabi fanatics and Arab centric ideologues who can at best aspire to be irritants in the social fabric of the Sahel. Each indigenous articulation of the Islamic religion in the Sahelian context offers yet more evidence of Islam's ajamiization in West Africa, as well as the futility of the neo-colonial aspirations of Arab-centric militants. However dire the situation in Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Nigeria may seem, the social disruptions that have recently occurred have taken place within a deep Sahelian matrix that has existed long before the emergence of the Abrahamic religions. Religious practices that Wahhabi militants reflexively demonize as occult sorcery may be traced back thousands of years, even to the very dawn of human civilization. This is also why it is safe to predict that the jihadists who have disrupted the lives of so many people in the last few years will fail. Responsibility for what has happened does not belong to the region's inhabitants alone. The indigenous peoples of West Africa did not create the current crisis and they cannot reasonably be expected to fix it on their own. Beyond eliminating security threats still posed by Arab centric Islamic groups in the region, it is imperative that responsible Western nations provide greater funding for education as well as many other forms of sustainable development rather than continue to arm the region and thereby foment further unrest. In Libya and Mali, the United States and France especially should do everything in their power to help rebuild these shattered republics, starting with massive investment in basic infrastructural resources and public education. In Mali and throughout Northern Africa more generally, the Sharifs of the North must re uh, renounce their false claims to superiority on the basis of their blood descent and embrace equality for all their nation's citizens under the law. They must become full players in the post-colonial republics to which they belong, renouncing extrajudicial violence and accept the state's monopoly on law enforcement. In the 19th century, the French adopted a policy of dividing and conquering local inhabitants in order to colonize the region without the loss of French lives. Uh, Colonel Louis uh, Archinard and, and many others were quite happy when the Amarian Tijani and the Messina Fulani decimated one another in a sectarian war that led to the demise of both El Hajj Omar and Amadou Amadou, uh, the son of Sekou Amadou. El Hajj Omar's followers called him Sheikh El Murtada or the favorite of God because they believed that God divinely elected him as a leader on earth. Sekou Amadou similarly advanced claims about his own chosen status as a blood descendant of the prophet Muhammad, most infamous, excuse me, most infamously in circulating forgeries of the Tariq al-Fatash. 
but whether one is Fulani, Tuareg, Arab, Bella, Dogon, Bambara, Mande, and so on, all citizens in the Republic of Mali must enjoy equal rights under the law without regard for religion, ethnicity, gender, or any other aspect of their personal identity other than their rights as citizens to dwell in peace and security upon the shared surface of the land they inhabit. Liberty, liberty does not mean anarchy, but freedom within the law, which invariably implies the use of force. Those who do not wish to fully embrace their status as citizens of the state, equal to their fellow citizens in the eyes of the law, declare themselves to be foes of the state and must therefore suffer the consequences of their defiance. Despite the many challenges, now faced by the Sahelian peoples. The current chaos in the region is the result of foreign interventions, not any particular local failings. This is not to say that West African peoples do not bear some responsibility for the region's ills. Corrupt politicians have done their part to impede the region's development, uh, its, its, excuse me, its economic, techno technological, and cultural development. The setbacks of recent years should nonetheless be situated in the broader context of the region's ancient cultural history. Religious belief systems in West Africa originated long before the coming of Muslim or Christian missionaries. As documented in the Tariq el Fatash, the Tariq el Sudan, and many other texts, the Sahel has existed as an autonomous cultural zone for thousands of years. Within the context of that broader history, the many diverse peoples in the region have lived in relative peace and harmony arguably far longer than European peoples of the last few centuries. While there have certainly been catastrophes like the Saudian conquest of the 17th century and the war that broke out between the Umarian Tijani and the Messina uh, Kadri or the Fulani, there have uh, been no conflicts in the Sahel on the scale of those that have taken place in Europe. The Sahel is a mature civilization with a long history of peaceful coexistence among its inhabitants. It is only with difficulty that we may begin to fathom the profound depth of its cultural past. Okay, and so that's a brief summary of my research. And now I'm just very briefly uh, to say, I wanna say just a couple words about areas in need of further research. And I'm speaking specifically in, in regard to directions my own uh, work has taken uh, in the last few years, such as the translation I did of uh, the archive of the Marian Tijani. So in, in The Wretched of the Earth, Frantz Fanon famously chastised those who sought to discover the wonders of Bantu ontology without attending to the plight of the Bantu who suffered due to the miseries of colonization. Fanon's warning is worth remembering today. When I began my research on the Sahel some 30 years ago, the region had not been engulfed by the many catastrophes that have taken place since the US and French led attack on Libya leading to the region's destabilization. The current crises, I believe, call for action that is grounded in understanding, especially in the case of interventions from agents external to the region. But I cannot help but feel that political action must take precedence over research at present. This action can and should include better educating the public about what is now taking place. This is especially the case in the Anglophone world. Many American citizens don't understand what is happening in the Sahel simply because they don't speak French. I have myself sought to make a contribution in this regard by recording lectures in English about the Sahel and uploading them on my YouTube channel. As a case in point, if you enter the name Eid Agali in search engines, very little information will appear that is in English rather than French. Yet Eid Agali is one of the most dangerous jihadists in the world. I have therefore uploaded one of my lectures on Agali on YouTube. This is just one, one example of the kind of work I've, I'm doing now. I've also recently translated works on the Jihad of the Amarian Tijani to better inform the English speaking world about the history of the region. My goals of late have therefore been more pedagogical and informative than scholarly. As a scholar of the Sahel for many years, I've shifted in this direction because I believe this is what current, the urgent current circumstances demand. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Professor Wise. I think uh, once again, I, uh, you know, as you were presenting ideas and when we look at your, your chapter, one feels that the, there's an opportunity to look at what happens in other parts of the continent as well. 
in terms of Islam's interaction or the Muslims' interaction with ATR, because ATR has, uh, for example, in in southern Zimbabwe, you have the Varemba tribe that basically, of course, has been dispute between among Jewish scholars and Muslim scholars saying that they are more Jewish rather than Muslim. But then there are also those who are still adherents of ATR in terms of how they interconnect with the religious traditions such as the, uh, uh, the various uh, Abrahamic faiths. Be that as it may, I think uh, the opportunity for further research is sort of there. But I think for the Sahel itself, much more I, I, I take it needs to be done. And I think you're sort of, you have given us sort of uh, much. Let's uh, move to our next uh, presenter. Um, we turn to uh, Professor Abdullah uh, Abu um, Uba, sorry, Adamu, who holds a double professorship in science education and media and, <laughs> and uh, cultural communication from Bayero University, Kano. He teaches at the Department of Information Media Studies at Bayero University and he has served as a Fulbright African Senior Research Scholar at the University of California and an academic resident at the Rockefeller Foundation. And, uh, and then also in 2012, he was appointed the European Union Visiting Professor for the Modern University Project at the Department of Languages and Cultures at the University of Warsaw. He has given lectures uh, as visiting professor at the University of Florida, Rutgers, Basel, Cologne, and Hamburg. His research focuses on transnational media flows and the impact on the transformation of Muslim house of popular culture, especially literature, film, music, and performing arts. Professor Abdullah. Thank you very much. Um, I have permission to share my screen? Yeah. Uh, as you can see, my presentation is on Islamic calligraphy, abstraction, and magic talismans in, in northern Nigeria. And uh, my paper, uh, the, the, with the way in which the Muslim Hausa of northern Nigeria, uh, the Muslim Hausa in northern Nigeria, take the Islamic world, you know, the Quranic world, and transform it into an aesthetic form. Uh, in order to show reverence for the Quranic world. And in, in this particular process, there is a radical difference between how art and aesthetics in Northern Nigeria is seen from the mainstream Arab world. So I distinguish between Arab aesthetics and Islamic aesthetics uh, in Northern Nigeria. Islamic calligraphy uh, centers on the art of the Quranic world, uh, creating a visual tapestry of artistic expression appreciated across all cultures. Beauty is beauty, regardless of the culture. This art of the world became interwoven with the emic artistic inclinations of various Muslim communities. And despite transnational influences, creates a vividly recognizable, independent, and unique Islamic art forms in Africa centered on the Quranic world. The variation between West African and Middle East and Arabic scripts emphasizes the aesthetic departing point between the two forms of writing, even if writing the same thing. This saw the emergence of two scripts that have sources in the mode of reciting the Quran, the Warish, coming in Northern West Africa, and Hafs, coming in other parts of the Muslim world, particularly Arabic Muslim world. The Warish vocalization as written effectively became Achami in Northern Nigeria, referring to its known Arabic use of the Arabic script. And this was perfected among the Hausa of Northern Nigeria who use it both as discursive as well as artistic form. On the right of the screen, you can see how the world script, which in Northern Nigeria we call Ajami, is used to domesticate linguistic expressions in the local language. And this is exactly the same in the entire West African region where the, the, the world script is adopted as a literary form. But in Northern Nigeria, it is, it is just more than a literary form. It is also seen as an artistic form, as I, uh, the chapter indicates. Now, this is an example of the, the variation of the same point uh, and, and the way it can be used in different ways. Uh, the first line says uh, coronavirus. Second line translates coronavirus as tutor corona. And the third line is from Arabic, virus corona. 
Now, the Hausa don't have a word for disease. I mean, they don't have a word for a virus. They only have a word for disease. So to them, to tell Corona means the, the disease of Corona, but there's nothing like a coronavirus. But the way it is written, uh, it indicates a, a domestication of the uh, word script in order to communicate a particular form of vocalization of the Quran when it was read so that the local people understand it. The last, uh, the, the, the last example there, Peru's uh, Quran, uh, is written in the half script. And this used to hold people in such awe, such that even sweet wrappers, chocolate wrappers, uh, candy wrappers that have Arabic inscriptions on them were seen as religious and, and were revered simply because the, 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 the Muslims in northern Nigeria refer any Arabic script, thinking that it, if it is Arabic, then it must be Quranic. And if it is Quranic, then it must be religious. Not knowing that some of these just simply a list of ingredients on a particular uh, product. And that goes to show the power of the, of, of the Arabic script uh, within religious milieu of northern Nigeria and the way it is, it is seen. So creating the world's script has liberated the, the Muslim in northern Nigeria from the belief that every single writing uh, in, in Arabic is a religious writing. And that, that gave them a much more freedom to approach the aesthetics of the Islamic world. Now, there are four trajectories to Islamic calligraphy as developed here in Northern Nigeria. The first one is the Dayana, which concentrates on geometric patterns, colors, lines, and gradients. The second one is what I call high definition penmanship, which is coupled with the Dayana. The penmanship deals with the discursive writing of the Quran. And then the third one is the secularization of the Dayana, because the Dayana was initially meant uh, to be seen within a particular religious context. But then we created an urban aesthetics that decolorizes the Dayana and takes it away from its religious milieu into a much more public domain. And then finally, shamanism, which uses arts, zoomorphic uh, designs, and, uh, and, and grids. I am going to look at each one of them uh, briefly with examples. Let's start with the, the first trajectory, the Yana, which is basically on, on geometric uh, 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 patterns. Now, the house of respect for the Quranic word is such that they, they don't feel that they can use the same kind of uh, 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 aesthetics or graphics that the Arabs uh, use in, 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 dealing with, uh, in, in dealing with calligraphy, because all the, 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 the calligraphic formations of the Arab world is seen as wasad ayar Allah, that is playing with the word of God. And therefore, uh, the, the Islamic text, for particularly anything that deals with Islam, uh, like uh, the Kalama Shahada, la ilaha illallah, is, is supposed to be written in a very, very straightforward manner so that it doesn't seem to be like you are playing around with it. So what they do, therefore, is to maintain the structure of the Quranic word, but then they surround it with, with a beautiful pattern in order to emphasize its beauty, its significance, its, uh, the, 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 the power of the Quranic word. So their, their perception of art and aesthetic is not really the same as the what in the, in the Arab world, even though they share the same uh, religious uh, context. So they approach the reverence of the, of the, of the, uh, the Quranic word by encoding it in what they perceive to be localized uh, beauty. And, and this beauty in forms of uh, shapes, Squares, uh, triangles is considered is called Zayana, and it's a, it's a perfect industry here in northern Nigeria. These are examples of, of these Zayana designs. Uh, Quranic education in northern Nigeria is administered to students by a wooden sledge called Allo. And uh, at the end of uh, the study of, of the Quran, when a person has completed the studies of the Quran, uh, he is given a certificate, and that certificate is beautifully decorated with Zayana. And uh, students go around the town showing uh, other people the, 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 their certificate and people give them uh, blessings uh, because of what they have been able to achieve in, in, in the fact that they have been able to complete their studies of the Quran. So the idea is that the wooden slates are decorated, uh, beautifully decorated, but the main text itself maintains its uh, very somber character. So that there isn't any calligraphic display of the main text itself, but the main focus is, is on beautifying the text and surrounding its, its, uh, its structure with, with all these uh, beautiful, beautiful designs. As you can see, there are examples. And the one in the middle is a, is a blank space where the actual, the actual uh, uh, ayah from the Quran is, is written in that particular space. 
It's a whole industry. And a lot of young people are involved in the, in the, in the production process. Are they artists or are they craftsmen? Who knows? The idea is that at the end of the day, what we want is to create something that is absolutely visually beautiful uh, and something that reflects urban aesthetics. And most of the people who are doing this are young kids who are colorists. And so what they do is somebody designs the actual, uh, the Yana design, uh, the patterns, and then the children use uh, color markers in order to fill in all those grids. Uh, in the past, they used to use water-based inks, but uh, creating water-based inks is extremely difficult. So now they just simply use uh, uh, normal uh, markers that are sold uh, commercially in the market. The second is the HD, what I call HD penmanship. The HD penmanship uh, indicates scribes who are who who could write the Quran beautifully with a very very absolutely wonderful beautiful writing, uh, and and with that 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 itself is an art form. It's considered art form with or without the design. But what they do is when they write the Quran in a such a beautiful cursive handwriting, then they surround it again with the yana. And that this time is done on uh, uh, paper rather than on wood. So we now have printed Quran and these printed Qurans are downloaded as it were from the memory of the Hafiz, that the person who has memorized the entire Quran. So they download it on a, on a paper, normally conqueror paper. But the cursive uh, script that they use, which of course is still the word script, is done in a very, very artistic manner in order to emphasize the beauty of the word. So the, the idea is that as you're reading the Quran yourself and you're reading it from a beautiful script, you feel the sense of joy and beauty in what you are reading. And, and that works very, very perfectly well because it, it gives the people a sense of uh, humility, humbleness, and that you are in, in, in a powerful uh, uh, um, uh, literary uh, uh, environment. And that powerful literary environment helps to strengthen your faith. These are examples of, uh, of the Quran that is uh, written in an aesthetic form here in Northern Nigeria. And uh, it's written on paper and all of it is surrounded either by colors uh, or patterns or grids in order to emphasize the beauty and the awesomeness uh, that the word is, is, is beautiful, it's awesome, it's fantastic. These are Quranic school graduates. Uh, when they graduate from the Quranic school, they are given this beautiful uh, uh, aloe, that is uh, the certificates that are brilliantly decorated, both males and females. There's no gender discrimination here. Everybody has equal access to the same education and they all ascribe to the same aesthetics, to the same sort of uh, beauty. Like I said, uh, producing the certificates uh, with the Yana designs and in the whole industry. Now, after a while, <clears throat> we realize that the, the Yana design is a beautiful as it is, should be desecularized. It should be removed from its religious setting so that it can now become an, a normal urban aesthetic form within the Islamic world. Um, we, we feel that this, this will, will go a long way in promoting traditional, uh, traditional artistic forms uh, in, 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 the, in the area. So in early 2000s, we made a move to see how we can reimagine, to reconfigure the, the concept of the Dayana from its religious context to another context so that the beauty of the Dayana can now be part of public visible display. And uh, based on that, we established uh, an institute called Gabari Institute of Geometry and Graphic, Graphic Design uh, in Kano. We currently have about 40 students. Uh, the focus is on geometric designs. Uh, we, we teach them the Yana as well as uh, geometric design, but we want them to take away the Yana designs and their geometric designs away from the wooden slate or even the paper material that they use to write the Quran into public spaces so that the, the, the beauty of the Yana design and the calligraphy can now be part of the public consciousness. Uh, these are examples of what... These are examples of uh, what, what we have been able to do. Uh, the, the same Quranic text is in case, but now in a, in a different form of uh, the Yana design. It's no longer about squares and the triangles, but about a uh, uh, cycle. So the focus is mainly on, on, on circles and the multiple ways in which the circle could be used and could be colored. When we started, the artists were not using the red color. For some reason, they avoid red colors, but uh, we encourage them to use red colors because the red color tends to attract attention uh, to the design itself. So now they, they started using these red colors and uh, the, the, the designs are initially on their own, but then we, we pay the problem of what do we do with them? So we decided to start marketing them and trans transposing them. So we took them away from the paper material, we took them away from the wooden uh, environment and we put them on wall murals. So we started using wall murals in order to reflect the Diana design as well as on uh, fabric. 
Uh, this is a lady who is uh, who has designed a beautiful Diana for a bed sheet. This is a, a, a bed sheet. And uh, the gentleman over there is the actually uh, the proprietor of the, of the school. And uh, he has been commissioned to go to mosques and also do the same design. Before we started this project, most of them are mosques are blank. They, they don't have any decoration because a lot of people believe that mosques should not have any decoration. But when we came up with this conception of uh, the Yana design in the mosque, uh, it, it reinforces the beauty of the Yana design and attracted more people to the mosque. Uh, and uh, we feel that uh, the end justifies means because a lot of people are now coming to the mosque. Of course, after they finish their prayer, they start taking pictures and photographs where the wall murals are because this is something new to them. We also decided to commercialize the designs and, and like portraits. So we have a, a whole industry where we produce the designs and then sell them out in the market, uh, mainly hotels and so on. We try not to sell the ones with the Quranic uh, expressions to hotels uh, because of the, of the debate here about some of the things that happen in hotels. So we use those blank designs, uh, like the one on the right, uh, to, 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 to sell to hotel corridors and things like that. And government offices are also buying this. So we have created a small Bible industry uh, on, on the Diana designs and how art and artistic forms uh, could be utilized in order to make, not only to make money, but also to further the cost of art. And finally, uh, we have arts, grids, uh, and uh, shamanism, uh, where, where the power of the Quranic word is still maintained but it is reimagined and reinterpreted and given new mystic powers by the Hausa as uh, you know, some kind of protective amulet or textual amulet. Uh, and they, they believe that uh, with this shamanism, you'll be able to create a new form of invincibility in any way you like. And uh, this, this shamanism is reflected in the production of text amulet called uh, Katamai. They call them Katamai here, but it's, of course it's Katim. And again, it's another viable industry itself. And this, this uh, designs were produced by Marabu, who was open, very limited understanding of the Quran. But then at the same time, there are Marabus who have a very, very deep understanding of the Quran, but they apply on the gullibility of their followers who believe whatever they sell them. And therefore, they use this textual amulet as an example of how they can circumvent the difficulties that they face in their normal life. Uh, with internet, uh, Hatame merchants open Facebook accounts and uh, they, they start dishing out uh, all, all these uh, advices on, on, on people on how to make, uh, how to become rich, how to, to get the, the, the beautiful girl to marry you, and, and so on. The man on the left is a merchant for this Hatame. He sells them in the local market here. And on the right is a whole bundle of them. And I had an interview with him. I, I, I asked him, if he believes in all these Hatume and their shamanism. He said he doesn't, uh, but people believe in them and they buy them. And uh, so long as there's a good money for it, you continue selling them. But uh, some of them are extremely outrageous about what they claim they can enable you to do. I mean, if you write all this in 10 times and you wash it on a, or write it on a, on a wooden slate and you wash it off and you drink it, you're going to become super rich. You're going to be super powerful. And if it doesn't work, it is not because it will not work. It's because you don't believe it will work. So they, they, they have all this belief that unless you absolutely believe this is going to work, it's not going to work. But if you absolutely believe it will work, then it will work. <clears throat> so the, the shamanic uh, calligraphers use uh, verses uh, from the Quran, um, group of words or an individual word and create a visual tapestry of calligraphic transformation based on this word to produce a textual amulet that claims to be cures to various elements. This included getting publicly rich, getting rid of enemies. <clears throat> There's even one on how to locate your lost goat, uh, winning affections of a beautiful woman, passing an examination without having to read for any text, and any other curative function the scribe can, uh, can drum up with. The amulets are decorated by boxes, reeds, and the old calligraphic zoomorphic figures of birds, and the consistent words script of either the Quranic word or Hausa instruction on, on, on their youth. These are examples of these uh, textual shamanic uh, amulets. Uh, as you could see, the, the, the actual writing itself maintained the world script, but then it has been decorated with a lot of uh, graphic elements in order to uh, draw attention uh, to it. And uh, each one of them, of, of these, is supposed to give you uh, some kind of supernatural power that will enable you to circumvent some of the things that are facing your life uh, immediately. So finally, uh, for the Muslim house, uh, a calligraphy has moved from neat, beautiful handwriting 
to paying artistic homage to the same neat and beautiful handwriting, not because it is made by artists who are fastidious about their writing, but because of the writing, because the writing is the word of God. How the calligraphic aesthetics therefore radiate from inside the circle, enclosing the world to the outer margins, reinforcing the protection and the beauty of the Quranic word. By domesticating the word script and creating the Yana calligraphy on the script, Hausa calligraphers have reaffirmed their ownership of the artistry of African Islamic calligraphy, deployed from mainstream Arabic calligraphic aesthetics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abdullah. I think, again, you've touched on a sort of a topic that, uh, again, needs further exploration. There's been a uh, number of other similar schools and institutions that have emerged of late uh, specializing in Islamic calligraphy. One just wonders to what extent has the house uh, Islamic calligraphy influenced the Fulanis or the other tribes in the region? Have they? Have they not? So I, I think uh, that you can come to when we sort of uh, come to question them. But I think, again, one can look at uh, lots of uh, comparative uh, studies here too. Um, let me come to our last uh, the presenter. Um, we will have uh, Professor Sharif Ayuba Korea completed his uh, PhD in African language and literature at the University of Wisconsin, Madison in 2008. His doctoral dissertation centers on the three Senegalese writers, Osman Semben, Mariam Ba, uh, and Sheikh Hamidou Kani. Dr. Korea's research and publication uh, focus on <laughs> Islam <laughs> literature. <laughs> And he is co-chair of the English department at Madison <laughs> College, Wisconsin, <laughs> where he teaches composition and literature. Uh, Dr. Kriya is also <laughs> vice chair for the Association <laughs> of African Studies <laughs> Program. We hand over to him. I see Abu Naki saying. Thank you and good morning. Let me share my screen here. My name is Sharif Korea, and I first of all would like to apologize for missing um, the beginning of, of this panel. I, I, I was, even after living in the US for 25 years, I'm still struggling with figuring out the time difference. <laughs> so my chapter focuses on Islam in European African literature. And for my presentation today, I would like to highlight um, why I chose this particular topic and, and also the works that I have decided to, to study. Beginning with the issues that prompted me to write this chapter, I noticed in the literature distorted, incomplete, or hasty responses to Islam in Europe and African literature. And I wanted to know really what accounted for, for these distortions or incomplete readings of Islam in African literature. I thought about the lack of familiarity with Islam and, and Islamic texts. Some, some critics have argued that it is due to a lack of familiarity with Islam and Islamic texts. I also noticed an over-reliance on colonial history and also categorization of African writers' representations of Islam. Now, the lack of familiarity reminded me of when I was in grad school and I was a teaching assistant for a class called Africa, an introductory survey at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I noticed that whenever we, we, we used to have guest speakers who would come and, and talk about African politics and sometimes the geography, history, because that course was cross-listed in seven departments. But I noticed that during discussions, students did not want to engage with any questions that they thought was complex. No disagreements when talking about Africa. And I went to talk to the professor who was in charge of the class and he said, Sharif, we want our idea of Africa to be simple. Now I always wondered what that meant. We want our idea of Africa to be simple. And that simplistic approach 
to Africa is something I noticed when I started doing research on Islam in African literature, that we wanted to categorize African writers as being promoters of Islam or demoters of Islam or being apostate and being reverent or being traditionalist and so on. But why do we feel the need to categorize African writers that way? There is some value in categorizing African writers because that categorization clearly shows that Islam is diverse. But when we look at literature, when we categorize writers like that, we fail to acknowledge the complexity of their representation of African literature in their works. And so I wanted to, since there is this over-reliance on colonial history, for my work, I decided to begin with a review of the history of Islam in West Africa. And since this is a chapter published in a book with I mean, great people here who know a whole lot about history than I do, I kept the review quite short, but I wanted to illustrate something that Bernard Savin said yesterday, that the advance of Islam was a long and difficult process and accepted that premise, approaching then Islam with that premise that it was a long and difficult process clearly shows that we are interested in complexity. And so in reviewing the history of Islam, I deliberately chose to study um, works by Ablai Barajob, Mahmoud Djouf, Albert Gerard, Basir Uje, Bambam Bahanjob, Christian Colon, Martin Klein, Martin Klein, sorry, I'm mixing the French and, and English here, Robin, um, David Robinson and so on, because I thought they gave us a complete picture of the history of Islam in West Africa. And so after establishing that Islam is a complex, that the, the, the events of Islam was a long and difficult process in Africa, I was able to again look at the critical response that Islam has generated. And then so I wanted to go back to, to that um, over-reliance on colonial history. And I look at Paul Marty, 1917, and the French coinage of the, of the expression Islam Noir. And here I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a quote by Sesame and, and, and Suarez. Islam Noir is a specifically black or African Islam, a particularistic Islam that the French assumed to be different from Islam practiced elsewhere in the Muslim world. Now the problem with this that the definition, but the problem with Islam Noir is that the French, when they used the term Islam Noir, the expression Islam Noir, they did not mean to illustrate the complexity or diversity of Islam. They were not trying to say that there is something unique about Islam in Africa, and this Islam in Africa is different than other kinds of Islam. There's something demeaning about the expression Islam Noir, that Islam Noir is less than. It is less than the kind of Islam practiced, let's say, in the Middle East. And, and there is something problematic about the terminology. And Ahmed Bangura, in his book, um, Islam in the West African Novel, even took it to the, to, 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 to the next step where he argues that the term Islam Noir is a racist appellation. Now, the problem with Islam Noir and over-reliance on colonial history is that some critics then tend to use colonial history to analyze contemporary African literature with an Islamic subtext. For example, this statement from Boyd Bugs that says, Quranic education in Senegal lacks competency and the situation hasn't changed appreciably since 1917. And I included 1917 there because in that particular case, Paul Marty, what Paul Marty said about Islamic education in Senegal in the 1900s was used, was applied to analyze Sheikh Ahmed Khan's L'Aventure Ambigu, where I thought it's really problematic to go back to colonial history to try to analyze contemporary African literature. And for Ahmed Bangura, this kind of, of Islam in African literature is due to a failure to situate the conflict dramatized in La Venture Ambigu within an Islamic paradigm. So for, for my chapter, therefore, I wanted to explore what analyzing, reading African literature within that Islamic paradigm really entails. But even though I, I, I find value in how Ahmed Bangura defines um, the Islamic paradigm, 
I wanted to take it one step further because for Bangura, um, there are certain criteria before the, the, the anybody is qualified to analyze African literature with an Islamic subtext. That for Bangura, the writer has to be familiar with Islamic texts, but the critique has also to be familiar with Islamic texts. I do not have a problem with that. However, when looking at the Islamic paradigm for Bangura, Bangura would look at the work by the work of Aminata Sofal from Senegal. And then he argued that Aminata Sofal um, if you if you are to analyze Aminata so far within an Islamic framework, it doesn't really qualify because Aminata so far emphasizes Chassan, traditional Senegalese culture, and this is really where I choose to deviate from Islamic the Islamic paradigm that Bangura is proposing to to choose something that's more in line with um, I'm, I'm going to go back here to to choose something that's more in line with um, what Kenneth Harrow proposes. In, um, in his book, in his seminal book, Islam in African Literature, The Faces of Islam in African Literature. And I'll come back to that. Let's just take a look at um, So Long a Letter very quickly. These are statements about So Long a Letter. And I chose these statements to again illustrate the incomplete reading that we have here. The first one, in spite of her education, her lucid intelligence, her love of life, Ramatulai retains a strong sense of the traditional role of Muslim women and the old moral values. When you look at the second part of the quotation here, Ramatulai retains a strong sense of the traditional role of the Muslim woman and the old moral values, you would see this as a compliment to Ramatulai and a celebration of her ability to retain a strong sense of her strength, a strong sense of the traditional role of Muslim women. However, the first part of the quotation really suggests that we do not expect someone who is so educated and so lucid in her intelligence and, and, and who loves so much to hold on to her traditional role of Muslim women. And what does, do, do, what does that traditional role really entail? It is problematic. We will, we will come back to that. In Silong Lettre is a reflection of life in a psychological ghetto of mental torture and social disorder where a woman is a slave and beast of prey. And here, by woman, we have to understand the Muslim woman is a slave and beast of prey. Abandonment is predominantly a female condition. It is both physical and psychological, and it transcends race, class, ethnicity, and caste. Hence, the universality of this cry of the woman, understand Muslim woman, subjected to this condition. Now, since this Muslim woman is subjected to this condition, what does Mariamaba propose? to give this woman a sense of agency. Now I chose Sheikh Amidou Khan and, and Mariam Abba because I think their texts participate in a discourse that identifies itself as Islamic. But this is what I, where I say I deviate from, from what Bangra proposes. I propose to read these novels within an Islamic framework. And this in Islamic framework will include inf influences by local beliefs and interpretations of Islamic texts. That is, in doing so, I recognize Ma um, Mariam Abba's work, Shah Amidou Khan's work, but also Aminata Sofal, who emphasizes Jassan as both Isla as, as all of them qualify as Islamic texts that can be read within an Islamic framework. In doing so, I, I use Richard Bullitt's The View from the Edge, and, and I heard a lot of statements that reminded me of The View from the Edge, where we try to look at Islam from the, 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 the narratives by looking at the narratives that were produced from the periphery, that we are not looking at it from the center. Because for, for Bulliet, he begins by explaining the, the view from the center being these grand narratives of history that will always begin with seventh century Arabia, that in order for anything to qualify as Islam, it should, it should align with Islam of seventh century Arabia. And in looking at Islam like that, we try to, fray, to, to kind of freeze the Islamic text in seventh century Arabia and everything that comes after is dismissed. 
But when we look at the view from the edge, that's where we look at Islam, the production of Islamic of literature in Africa and see that it has value and that we don't call it black Islam, we don't call it Islam noir, but it, it really illustrates the diversity and complexity of Islam as presented in African literature. So in L'Aventure Ambigu, I chose L'Aventure Ambigu and, and Une Si Longue Lettre, not just because they are written in French in European languages, but because of their willingness to engage with the French language, their willingness to engage with the language of the colonizer. Now, in, there's a difference here because in L'Aventure Ambigu, Sheikh Ahmed Khan uses um, Islamic philosophy as a counter argument to European philosophy. And, and this is speaking back to French philosophy and Islam by using Islamic thought. But this kind of um, is, 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 is possible in the colony. That is in the colony, Sheikh Ahmed Khan was able to use French language like that, or as we say, use the master's tool to dismantle the master's house, that he was able to do that with the French language. However, on Western soil, this is where um, we see for the first time, Jalo, becomes black. And that's really important here because when, when, when he is on Western soil, this is the first time we hear Samba Jalla introduce himself where he says, je, je suis musulman, I am Muslim. Je suis du pays de Jalobé. Therefore, for him, being Muslim and being Jalobé is the same thing. However, on Western soil, people don't see Samba Jalla as a Muslim. They see him as a black person. Now, this is the ambiguity of, of this is where the ambiguity of, 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 uh, of Samba Jallo's adventure really stems from. The fact that he was not able to reconcile his black identity and his Muslim identity. And then so what does he decide to do? He decides to embrace Western values. And he says, je suis devenu les deux. Now I am both. I am both Muslim, but also black, but also civilized and so on and so forth. And but. Hobby Bible reminds us that cultural difference is not the acquisition or accumulation of additional cultural knowledge, but it is really where we, the, the, the totality of culture is, is, is challenged when we find ourselves on the premise, when we find when we are removed from the center, that liminal space where difference, identity difference is negotiated. Back in the colony, therefore, this is where Sambajalo notices that back in the colony, he says, je ne sais pas ce que je crois. I don't know where I, what I believe. And this is where he starts to doubt. Not doubting in the Cartesian sense of the world, of, of the word, as in I doubt, therefore I think, therefore I am. But for Sambajalo, this doubting really puts an end to his life, literally. Now we look at in Silong Lep. Silong Lep, Mariam Baba uses the French language differently. Because in that particular, in this case, she proposes to use the French language to try to counter the representation of women in traditional Senegalese society. But this prise de parole, the Caesar of the word, doesn't work. It's not enough because it gave women, in, in this case, uh, in so long a letter, is it gave women a semblance of freedom and equality. However, because they failed to really engage with Islamic texts and, is, and, and they were never able to attain full liberation. And in analyzing the, the, the representation of women and, and women's quest for, for agency, I, I refer back to, to the theory in, in, in Maghrebian literature, referring to Asya Jabbar, Fatima Bernisi, um, Leila Ahmed, who, who really claim that for Muslim women to be free, they have to engage with the Islamic text. They have to engage with, with, with the Quran. So for my conclusion, when I look at the view from the edge, what it reveals is that African Muslim subjects have an ambivalent position towards Islam. And that ambivalence really def defies rigid categorization. It captures the moment when the boundaries that delineate identity politics shift. And this is where, again, it's not just an accumulation of, of, of different cultures, but trying to identify where those identifications, those the really shift and our positions shift. And, and that really shows that identity is dynamic, right? That Muslim identity is the product of a dynamic and constantly evolving process of resignification. And reading this text, therefore, within an Islamic framework, 
reveals a complex relationship between Islam and African Muslims. For further research, I am really interested in, in, in digging deeper into transnational African literature with an Islamic subtext, similar to what we're seeing, the, the great body of literature that we're seeing by um, Muslim immigrants, for example, in London. I, I would like, really like to see, to do more research on that and, um, and, 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 and see how, what maybe um, Sam Bajanlo experienced many years ago, how are, how are we re um, maybe envisioning? I don't even think it's the, it's the problem is not the research itself, but the kind of literature that contemporary African writers are producing that is deliberately willing to engage with 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 um, with the old text and 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 it may be reimagine what it means to be Muslim, to be an African Muslim in the United States, what it means to be an African Muslim in 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 France. What kind of literature is emerging from those places? Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Professor Sharif, for your presentation. Again, another important. Uh, paper that focus on an aspect that have been understudied. And I think something in your further research, looking at the transnational dimension, I think is, is critical across the continent because sometimes one thinks of, of contemporary Muslim writers that have been influenced by Western thought and how they basically engage with us. And so the issue of identity becomes very important in these literatures. I mean, to what extent do I have to absorb secularism vis-a-vis -vis our religious identity and how that plays out in their writings? So yes, indeed, we sort of look, look forward for, for more such research. I think we have basically come towards the, the end of your presentation, but we have uh, set you know, a time for question and answer. We've asked our... our um, organizers to basically give us more time. So we are uh, allowing for sort of an overrun. So let's um, open the floor to questions uh, for our three panelists. The last three, of course, we can always come back to the others uh, uh, if there's more time. Uh, so please, anyone who has an, would like to pose a question. Whilst we wait, I mean, I, I, if, if there's any hand, a, please uh, raise your I hand. I have a question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, where, where uh, who are we? I can't see the hand. Oh, yeah, Professor Ngom, sorry. Uh, well, thank you yeah. very much, Chair and uh, the panelists. I just have a very quick question to Professor uh, Adamu's uh, presentation related to his wonderful presentation. Uh, I was just wondering uh, how militant uh, uh, members of Boko Haram would react to the artistic innovations uh, that you've talked about? Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, getting to them to ask them about the artistic perception <laughs> is very, it's going to be very difficult. Um, but, but they condemn any of all these things as being heretic uh, and so on, as you, as you very well know. So they, they don't look at art and artistry. They look at the destruction of art. Uh, and, and actually, they share the same kind of mindset with all those uh, jihadists all over uh, West Africa that see any other form of uh, uh, aesthetics, urban aesthetics, uh, art as, as taking people away from God. And therefore, it's something that should be destroyed, something that should be stopped. So uh, Boko Haram and the other militants are more, more focused on trying to get rid of the Nigerian state <laughs> rather than worrying about shamanism and so on and so forth. But the shamanism... In, in, in the calligraphic shamanism, give, give them a basis for saying, look, this is what we are talking about. You are deviating from Islam. That's exactly the basis for the entire jihad thing, that you are deviating from Islam. You are, you are mystifying Islam and you are introducing syncretic practices into it. And so anything that, that deviates from, from Islam is, is seen as something to be, uh, to be uh, 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 reacted against. And that is why probably the evolution of the, of the calligraphic tradition in northern Nigeria did not follow the same mindset as Arabic calligraphy because already things are bad as it is already. So we don't want a situation where you feel that you have taken like a kalma shahada, la ilaha illallah, and then you start twisting it up and down, look like you are playing with the, with the word of God. So I, I think they will still retain their conservative structure. And also to, uh, to answer the, the question by the moderator about uh, 
difference between Mpulani and uh, Hausa uh, calligraphy. There isn't really any difference. Uh, the difference between Hausa and Pulani scholarship is, is really more of a media reported rather than it's, it's historical. But now there isn't anything like a Pulani scholar or a Hausa scholar or non Pulani scholar. Uh, but main, mainstream scholars are not really interested in calligraphy. The, the, the concept of beauty and aesthetic and calligraphic art form are actually carried sustained by their students rather than by the malams uh, themselves. It's by the student. It's a way of making money. And because it decorates the Quran and the Quran word, and it seems it's fairly harmless, there hasn't been any pulpit power, I mean, power coming from the pulpit to destroy them or to curse them or anything. So things are pretty cool, actually. Very, very cool. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Professor Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, great presentations. Uh, but I want to ask this question from uh, Cherry uh, Corey the last presenter. Okay. Uh, I enjoy your presentation. Uh, uh, really very fascinating. And um, you emphasize the fact that these writers, especially the colonial uh, writers, those Africans who wrote during the, the late or early post-colonial era, did not engage in uh, with Islamic texts. But uh, they didn't engage it. They didn't get in, uh, that this was, you consider this a major reason for their limitations and the weaknesses of their writings. But you, you didn't discuss that in your presentation. Uh, or, uh, the fact that they didn't engage in this, uh, you raised as a criticism. The question is why did they not engage in Islamic tech? Why did they not engage with it? Uh, and um, uh, reasons that you, why they fail to do this. And what do you mean by engaging in Islam, with the Islamic tech? What kind of things were you expecting them to do? And how do you think this engagement will, will have impacted the way they wrote their understanding and interpretations of Islam? Towards the end, you mentioned the fact that because they didn't engage, they were not able to obtain liberation. So, but no, no, you did explain that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question. And of course, we're limited in time here, only had 15 minutes to, to present. Um, but um, I, I want to clarify two things. When I said the writers did not engage with, when I said lack of engagement with Islam, I was talking about um, women when, in so long, in, in so long later, where in West Africa, female writers did not engage with, with the Islamic text in the sense that they were not using uh, Islam or openly challenging certain practices that were condoned by Islam. For example, in, in Silong Lent, um, the, one, the, the main character after the death of her husband was mourning her husband and, and would talk about the, the Islamic text, how Islam um, maybe decided on how poly condone polygamy, right? And then so she should look at her husband's actions and would just say, as a Muslim, he is allowed to have multiple wives. And therefore, I'm not going to challenge what he did because Islam proposed that he is going to do it the right way. And this is really why I, what I mean by the failure to engage, like instead of engaging with the text and, and, and arguing whether Islam actually condones her husband's actions, the, the woman just said, I trust the man who tell me that the Quran ordains this. And therefore I don't need to dig deeper. I don't need to learn more about the Quran. And this is where I, I reference, for example, the work by women in North Africa, where I think they really engage with the Quran, uh, Leila Ahmed, Fatima Manisi, Manisi Amina Wadud, and all, where they actually wrote about in reinterpreting the Quran from a woman's perspective. And that's what I meant by engaging with the Quran, this, this willingness to read and so on. A question came up before about Sayyida Rahaya Ibrahim Manyas, the daughter of Ibrahim Manyas, who was the first one to, to start a Quranic school in, in, in Senegal. And that's the kind of engagement we don't see in literature. 
Okay, that, and I just wanted to clarify that I was talking about the literature itself. And, and the other thing about um, the lack of engagement, it was not so much about the writers themselves or from lack of familiarity with Islam, because Sheikh Amir Khan engages with Islam in the sense that there's a lot of intertextuality between Lavantir Ambigu and the Quran. That is, you read Lavantir Ambigu, the whole philosophy that he uses in Lavantir Ambigu is an Islamic philosophy that he uses to counter Western hegemonic ideas. And therefore, that's what I mean by engagement, right? The writer's willingness to, to use the Quran, to deliberately use the Quran to say, for example, when, when um, Samba Jalo said, I am Muslim, that statement was important, but he did not anchor that statement in, in the Quran or the Shahada or anything like that. It's, he said that I, I am Muslim because he was offered pork and alcohol, and he said, I don't drink it, I don't eat pork because I'm, my religion forbids it. Now, that idea, okay, I don't do this just because it's forbidden by my religion, instead of trying to really understand what is the rationale behind it, that's really what I meant by engagement. I, I hope that explains it. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks very much uh, for your response there, uh, Dr. Sharif. Let me, uh, there's uh, in the chat uh, box, there's a question by Jibril asking, uh, posed to Professor Adamu, uh, in your discussion on desecularization, the Zayana, you kept saying we. What do you mean by that, especially as it relates to your positionality as a researcher? Well, I, I have already answered him, but uh, I, I think I would explain the fact that uh, I effectively became embedded in the system myself. Initially, I was just an outsider, just reporting it, but then I became so involved in it that I feel I could provide a direction to it. So uh, maybe I have committed an uh, intellectual crime by uh, getting involved in the ecosystem. But uh, the, the, out, the output was, was so beautiful that I felt justified because uh, if we don't continue with the aesthetic tradition, it is going to, be remain, it's going to be remain locked up in the Tayana design. So yes, by we, I mean I and a couple of researchers, including Mustafa Kruti, who is uh, also here and uh, an associate of uh, 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 Ungo, uh, decided to give it a boost in order to, to popularize it, uh, to, to, to make it a much more viable process. Okay, thanks. Uh, Professor Wise, uh, you would like to add some thoughts from yourself? Yeah. Presentations very much. The presentation on Ajame and Sharif Korea's work looks really interesting to me as I've had uh, uh, a number of years, I've been very interested in Yambo Walla Gum. In fact, I would, I would be, ask, be interested in asking uh, 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 Sharif if he has any thoughts uh, in relation to his work, a very interesting work on the, the, the uh, novel of Walaga, the Devoir de Violence. Sharif, you want to uh, quickly? Yeah, thank you, Professor Wise. I, I think it's just one of, one of those other instances where, especially when you look at the, the Devoir de Violence uh, bound to violence, um, <laughs> Walaga's work has been really groundbreaking. And, 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 and I think the he, he definitely illustrates that ambivalence that, that I tried to, to emphasize in my, in my conclusion that um, Islam, Islam is, is um, the, the, in, the infusion of Islam in, in Africa has been quite problematic. And, and we, we, we've seen that representation in, in for example, Cheto by Usman Semben and, um, and Wallagum's Bound to Violence. And even Aikwe Arma of Ghana writing about it in season, uh, if, um, in 2000 seasons. That, that is a very disturbing portrayal for many Muslims who believe that talking about any kind of violent intrusion of Islam in Africa is um blasphemous you know we just like no islam was in meaningful means in meaningful ways and in sorry in peaceful in peaceful ways and 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 to talk about the violence to attach any kind of violence to, to islam is unacceptable and this is where i think like when you look at um Welagum or semben or or arma they they really had to the, the courage to talk about that that aspect of the intrusion of Islam, we don't want to talk about, or we don't want to acknowledge in the African context. So I think his his work has been has been 
really great in 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 showing that part of Islam we're not proud proud of. And when I say we, I'm I'm really talking about um, you know Professor Wise mentioned this this purist you know who who really who think that Islam is all divine and therefore we we cannot attach any kind of violence or 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 or, or negative connotations to 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 it. So. Yeah, I, I think his work has just been amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, there, are, there are two more uh, uh, individuals want to pose questions. We will allow them and then uh, close. Uh, Fatma, Mullah, please ask a question. I have a question and a speculation for Professor Kareya. Um, my question is um, when you refer to sort of transnational um, uh, African writers with an Islamic subtext. I'm sure you're thinking of um, the Sudanese writer Leila Abu Leila. Um, are there any others that you have in mind? Because I can't think of any others myself. And then my, my speculation is whether it might not be the case that the um, writers you are looking at, who essentially write in the last quarter of the 20th century, perhaps they were at that point were politically obliged to enter the world republic of letters as black writers rather than Muslim writers. Whereas in the 21st century with a sort of shift in the political dynamic, um, 21st century writers like Leila Abu Leila have to engage not only as African, but they have to engage as, as Muslim African. Um, mm -hmm. That's my speculation absolutely absolutely it's well put and and that's why i said that um that it's not so much about the lack of research but the lack of um a body of literature i would like to see a, a, a greater body of lit literature em emerging from from this part of the world um with with that idea of emphasizing um the, the muslim I identity and Tariq ramadan kind of talks about how um when you look at the contemporary literature, transnational literature in Islam, that one thing that has shifted a great deal is we used to emphasize, um, let's say, uh, Dar al Islam. You know, it was more about the home of of, of Islam, where, and then and then you, you think about also the, the land of the infidels. <laughs> but now that's because Muslims were thinking about the other from a to, from two different geographical locations. But now when, when the two are in the same continent, on the same continent, the same um, geographical location, the dynamics shift, just like you said, uh, Fatima. I think that the dynamics shift and I, I, I hope, I would like to see something similar to what we're seeing in, in, in Anglophone literature by um, Teju Cole, by um, Chimamanda Adichie, um, by Dinao Mengistu, you know, who, who really talk about that, the notion of African identity as tra transnational identities being challenged. But what I see in, this, in their, their work, what's missing is that Muslim identity. I'm thinking about that Muslim immigrant. How is the Muslim immigrant? thinking about these, these, these different um, ideas. And I totally believe that um, that's why I want it to be the next step of my research. I, I, I hope to find um, a good body of literature there to, to help me explore those questions. Um, so I, I would like to hear, <laughs> I would like to hear um, suggestions for, for, for works to study there, but, but that's okay. definitely um, a good area to, to, to explore. Uh, Professor Bayo? Uh, no, thank you so much, uh, Professor Heron. Uh, I, I want to commend the effort of uh, uh, Professor Sarif Correa. Uh, uh, it's, uh, your research was, uh, I would say, is illuminating in the sense that uh, you explored different uh, ideas from a scholars, uh, their views on how Islam is in Africa. Uh, your citing of uh, uh, Sisman and Suarez's uh, 2009 uh, idea of uh, Islam uh, being in Africa, being a black, uh, you call it uh, Islam Noir. Uh, I think that's what you said, black or African Islam. Uh, 
the, there is this representation of a society in literature. Uh, the, the, the common expression idea is that literature mirrors uh, is society. Uh, looking at the trends, the, uh, religious trends in Africa, um, uh, and the, the image that uh, Islam seems to have because of a different violent act that uh, that uh, have invaded the West African space, for for example, uh, the Boko Haram and uh, other things, other things, uh, other uh, unexpected uh, occurrences in the society. I know that uh, having studied the uh, Islamic uh, religion uh, right from a uh, uh, elementary school to uh, to, uni uh, to university, taking some courses as a uh, as minor. Uh, there is this part of Islam that says uh, Islam is a religion of peace, and uh, there is something in the in the Korean. Uh, though I may not remember the exact uh, 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 part of Islam where it comes from, it says whoever does an atom weight of evil shall be rewarded in equal measure on the day of judgment, and uh, whoever does a atom weight of good so I'll be rewarded in equal measure. So now applying that to Islam, Islam is a religion of peace. But what we see today is different. Uh, people cling, deathless people, they cling to Islam and perpetrate evil. So we cannot deny that it is quite unfortunate. My question is this, coming to literature, uh, with the, with there are people that are trying to police the image of Islam to say this is what it is. And there are people denting the image of Islam, behaving in ways that totally contradict what Islam stands for. Now, looking at both, you will see that there is a struggle, a conflict between the the bad and the good. So in the, in the nearest future, who do you see winning this? Remember that literature documents what happens in a society. Who do you see winning at the end of the whole game? Looking at the trends that has evaded uh, West Africa. So, and uh, what would be your reasons to say that these are the winner, or this is who is going to win. Thank okay. you. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, before you respond, Professor Sharif, uh, uh, can I ask uh, Professor Falola to basically uh, uh, raise, uh, pose his question so that we can close after that? Thanks. Thank you, Professor Mohamed Aaron. I don't have questions. I just have comments. Oh, maybe, maybe before no, you comment. Yeah, okay. We, we can now, uh, Dr. Sharif, just to respond, and then you can comment, and we can work our way to the conclusion, if you don't mind. Uh, Dr. Sharif, can you just quickly? Yeah, Bayo, thank you so much. That's a great question. And one, one thing I tried to do when I was looking at the literature, I, I started by when I was talking about the, the issues that prompted me to, to write this chapter and to write the chapter the way I did. As I mentioned, the, the, the um, I, I mentioned categorization of African writers, and to to go back to your question, I I believe that categorizing African writers as promoters of Islam and demoters of Islam, to me, was not really very helpful. This is something that um, Professor Mbaicham um, has done to to really illustrate the diversity of responses that Islam has generated in African literature. Now, personally, I, I, it, I would not be in a position to say who's winning because what I was trying to do is to avoid that kind of categorization where we look at um, 
some some writers as being promoters of Islam or writers who are trying to portray a positive image of Islam and other writers who are trying to portray a negative image of Islam. What I actually saw is that, you know, when when we when this is literature and I and I and I was one one of the challenges with talking about Islam in, in Africa, and especially talking about Islam in African literature, is that I, I don't want to to end up really talk, approaching Islam as if it was African literature or an African novel as with as if it were a historical document or it was meant to teach us something about sociology because I know being a student in the United States we we use literature African literature especially to to teach African history we use African literature to teach to teach African to teach sociology or to teach Islam in in, in Africa. And there's something I personally think there's something dangerous about categorizing these writers the way we, we do by, you know, calling some promoters of Islam, demoters of Islam, and so on and so forth. For me, the, the, the most beneficial thing is to really try to think about the complexity of the Muslim identity. They create characters. The reason we keep going back to La Venture Ambigu is that Sheikh Almidou Khan was able to create a complex character in Sabah Jallo. You know, that we, we cannot pin Sabah Jallo to, to one particular image of Islam. And, 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 and therefore, for me, it's not about who's winning. I don't think we'll find the answer in literature. And I don't think we should be looking for that answer in literature. Because literature, one character in 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 um um Chinua Achebe's um and tales of the savannah said writers do not give prescriptions they give headaches and therefore we're not going to find prescriptions in these novels they will give us headaches they will give us a lot of questions to ponder over and how that's how i would like to approach it thanks thanks dr sharif professor valola you you have the word you can make your comments now thanks I'm very grateful to the chair for giving me this space. And I want to say a few things. The first is this um, conference, and I invited the publishers. They showed up yesterday. I don't know whether they are here today. One big take from the conference, and I'm really, really grateful, is to begin to persuade Pargrave to do everything in a way in which people can be updating their chapters. Mm. So we've tried, we are doing that as, as we speak, because I'm doing the Pargrave and Book of African Women's Studies with a model different from this one. In that model, there will be a constant update on the online version. We're doing online, and we're doing the hard book format. So what if arising from this, if there is a, a space in which we can engage in a conversation can we update the handbook because they will listen to me, although it's not sold out, in a way in which people can hide other topics and we do an online edition and we keep revising it. Um, and as I said, the, the way we set up the handbook of African women, they publish them online first. This year we'll do that book but they can keep revising them. So I will seek, I would need your advice on that uh, as we move forward in updating this scholarship, given the fact that the digital age has enabled that possibility, but I will need your advice on that so that I can communicate this arising from this conference back to the publishers. And the need for me to insist on this is about the concept of atrophy. All of us are going to be phased out, whether we like it or not. So the way all this, these handbooks are many, they're over 20, that there should be somebody who is younger, 
who can keep updating it, who will now also transfer it to another generation so that we maintain a certain level of continuity and stability. Other than that, I want to, as I said yesterday, express our profound gratitude to the organizers because this is not my idea. This is not Falu's idea. It is an idea by our colleagues at Duke. And yesterday, I was so happy that this idea occurred to someone because it's a model not just of bringing people together, but of sharing knowledge that this Zoom age has made possible. And I also have to thank members of the audience. Yesterday, I was surprised from where they came from. And today, I'm also surprised. The last person who's Professor Molola, who just asked questions is from Howard, he does languages. So our colleagues are here to support the conference. Professor Afolayan from Amshire, he does Yoruba studies, I'm glad. Our colleagues from Kano uh, and all of you. So Tracy from Ghana, Adi Joker from London and others that I don't know. But this, this is energizing. And um, I will do what they do in my culture as an elder. We are not supposed to talk too much, but and I, will, I will just say for this idea, for your support, may Allah increase your baraka. May you handle the paradox of life more carefully. That paradox is difficult. God says we must be very truthful. And God says, Allah says, without good character and faith, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But human being says, never be truthful because you won't get what you're seeking. And there is no character that matters but deception. So the Yoruba framed a paradox. If God and human beings are telling you different models of living, what do you do? Should you be truthful and lose the goodwill of human beings? But pay a price in heaven? Or should you develop character to see Allah? But stop short of becoming a dean and vice chancellor and a rich man like Trump? And that paradox will stay with us. And I will tell you a true story. It's not an anecdote. It's a true story. In the First Republic, there was not much money in Nigeria as we have now. Now there's so many Nigerian billionaires. If I tell people, they won't believe it. At the time of the First Republic, nobody will believe this anymore. One million. Only three Nigerians were millionaires. Three. Can you believe that? Today, there are <laughs> over a million of them have been because it's still this money. And one of them built this mansion, huge. And he invited the premier of Northern region, Amadou Belu, to come to the house warming. He attended, true story, true story. As, he was, as the sultan was leaving, he called him. He said, this house is very big, but do you know we are only going to live in this world for a temporary moment. Why do you build this mansion in a world in which at your age, you'll be lucky to have more than 10 years? And the Sultan said, look, build your mansion in heaven. Let us all build our mansions in heaven. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, 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 your, for your comments. I think we've all basically first enjoyed this particular panel. And I think uh, from what you have just mentioned, I would agree with you that these chapters need to be updated at some points uh, online because they are important for future generational scholars emerging. 
And I think our scholarship is ongoing until, of course, we are no more, but others will take on the baton. So I think the idea of, of doing so will be extremely helpful for the future generation of scholars emerging because they will be complementing, building on, and adding, and of course, amending where sort of we might have fallen short. Having said that, I think uh, once again, let me thank the panelists for having made the presentation very rich, very important. Uh, themes and each of those, when we, one look at, uh, looks at each one of them, they are book on, on their own. And of course, these chapters just summarizes some of the ideas that we can reflect upon. So thank you very much. And thank you for uh, Duke again for opening up this particular opportunity where we can share these ideas and particularly uh, having this particular meeting so that at least we can see the, the richness that exists and of course, what we can do in the future as the years roll by. Um, so we've oh, sorry, we're not to play my next track. All right, um, back to Zoom. So this kind of scene isn't unique to African Islam but it is significant to African Islam. The clean unison of the boys' voices is clearly the result of many hours of careful training. And to watch a rather large group of boys at this age singing together so carefully is also a good representation of the kind of generational transfers of knowledge that are central to Islam in Africa. Butch Ware has written extensively about Islamic pedagogy in Senegal and he attributes the teaching styles that are common, especially in North and West Africa, to the foundations of the Maliki School of Jurisprudence, which we find in the region. Maliki Jurisprudence gives precedence to the embodied example of a community over readings of hadiths. And here I'll quote from Ware's book, The Walking Quran, quote, the standard model in West Africa is that of an ijaza, permission to teach a specific text, text was not issued until it was not only understood and often memorized, but also actualized or embodied. Transmission from one whole generation to another in actual embodied practice was a check against idiosyncratic innovations and unprecedented interpretation. Maliki teaching came to stress practical, personified, human embodied example in the transmission of knowledge." End quote. I want to stress in particular the way that sound is at the heart of this pedagogical encounter. It's not an arbitrary mode of transition, but as we see in the video, it is one that widens the perceptual channels through which students may cultivate a pious sensibility. A separate point that comes across when looking at pedagogical practices throughout the continent is the role of women as educators. In the chapter, I mentioned some of the better known historical figures, Tara Masiti in Brava, Somalia, and Nana Asmao in Sokoto. But I think beyond these two women, if we're really putting the kind of value on the pedagogical encounter that we should, we'll find generations and generations of women from all over the continent who have contributed to schooling and pedagogy in important ways. And I'm reminded from the last panel of Dr. Freed's discussion of intermediate scholars who maybe didn't produce a lot of written texts, but um, so much in the way that they wrote and distributed poetry is, is still with us in, in a lot of different forms. Um, also, there is a question from Byron Maxey, his observation that um, elementary education is really part of the bedrock, right? And that we should really value it as, as such. So the second recording that I wanna play for you is from the poet Awa Gwaram from Northern Nigeria, who is profiled in Beverly Mack's Muslim Women Sing. Uh, her work is evidence that we would do well to regard the work of women like Asmao beyond their individual exceptionalism, but as part of an enduring movement among women to communicate and educate through music and poetry. So let me pull up the second clip. I'm gonna say, um, I don't speak Hausa and the, the CD that came with this book didn't do a particularly good job of linking up the two, 
but I found a poem that had some words that I recognize. Um, but if this is the wrong poem to match up with the audio, please, please correct me. Um, here's the poem. I need to pull up my other screen. Let me see here. Um, sorry about that. Let me try this again. Once again, my apologies if the text and the and the uh, audio don't quite match up. Um, now I'll move on to the second category in my chapter, which is assembly or associational life. And I have two motivations for making this cent a central category in my chapter. The first is that Muslim associations are very important to the ways that Africa is urbanizing. And I want to share just a quick graphic here that addresses that. Uh, in many situations, population growth in cities far outpaces the ability of governments to provide for people's basic needs. And Muslim associational life, largely within the framework of Sufi brotherhoods, has become important to the ways that people meet their needs. Um, the second reason that I'd like to draw attention to music and associational life is that many scholars of Sufi music have used the frame of mysticism to engage with Sufi practices but I think this kind of analysis misses an important point. Mysticism evokes an idea of a solitary communion between an individual and the divine. But in my view, Sufi Islam might be more productively seen as a collective tradition that has often thrived because of the distinct modes of social organization. The relationality that defines Sufi Islam is sustained through modes of assembly through pilgrimages, festivals, gatherings around sheikhs, and the weekly regular engagements in associational life. Assembly, the power of coming together in this context of urban African Sufi associations is overwhelmingly driven by sonic practices. I'll provide two examples today. The first is from Amdurman, Sudan. And the central figure in this scene holding the gun is Sheikh Alamin Umar Alamin who's known among his young followers for his specialized blessings for things like examinations and grants to study abroad. The aspect of the video that I want to highlight is how the relationship between the Sheikh and his followers is materialized in the ways that they sound and move together. This isn't quite the ecstatic disconnected state that people associate with dervishes or other Sufi orders, but one grounded in the relationships between sheikh and disciple, disciples with each other, and the entire assembly and Allah. So let's play the third clip now. Uh, next, I'll show a video of an association in Dakar that I'm very close with, a Disciples Association or Daira 
of the Murid Brotherhood called Diwanu Galas. This group, mostly young men and women, are regarded as being one of the more artistic disciples associations in the neighborhood where they meet Medina. And one of the points that I want to highlight is the way that these disciples create spaces in the city to be creative. In the video, I highlight the outer circle of dancers. Note several distinct chains of dancers, each synchronizing unique sets of gestures as they go around the circle. There's room here for many different people to express themselves in many different ways. And in this sense, the association contributes to a, si a situation where youth creativity is regarded as an urban resource. I also wanna note the way that so many different relationships come together in this musical performance musical performance, relationships with Allah as people sing La ilaha illallah, relationships with the Murid Order's founder, Amadou Bamba, with their Sheikh, Sudin Afia, and with each other through the rhythms that guide their movements, through the call and response singing patterns, and through the specific dances that people copy from one another. And this is adapted from a different paper that I gave. So I actually have highlights in the video that will show you the ways that different people throughout the circle are dancing in different ways. My point in showing these is to highlight throughout Africa the ways that Sufi life and urban life are converging and to highlight the importance of how people sound out and sound together in this relationship with the city. In the last section of the chapter, I write about transcendence and the privileged place of divine grace or baraka or barke in a lot of Muslim sonic spaces in Africa. In particular, I highlight a few important practices that help us understand the relationship between sound, divine grace, and the ways that African spaces connect with one another. The focus of this section is a group of practices often called Ganawa in Morocco or Stambeli in Tunisia. Both of these performed by descendants of sub-Saharan African slaves. The performances have a lot in common with the kind of zikr that we saw in the previous example. In both situations, worshipers perform suites of songs over the course of hours. In both, the songs are accompanied by a steady chorus of la ilaha illallah. Both involve percussion increasing in intensity over the course of an event. But there are two important distinctions. One is the subject of the suites of songs that we hear in Ganawa and Stambeli. Practitioners weave songs inviting sub-Saharan African spirits into a space together with chains of songs dedicated to North African saints. The genres thus create a sonic bridge connecting both sides of the Sahara. And for populations affected by the trauma of dislocation, the embodiment of a pantheon of black spirits and white saints creates an experiential space in which Sub-Saharan and North Africa are deeply imbricated with one another. The other distinction here is the way the central figures of these events the trancers or musamayin engage both in the world of spirits who possess them and in the world of divine grace, which pacifies the spirits. There's a porosity here between self environment and imaginal worlds that allows the trans trancer not only to experience divine knowledge, but also to materialize it in her being, imbuing the ceremonial space with Baraka. Uh, so here's the last video of my presentation.
so these are the three categories that form the core of my chapter, uh, pedagogy, assembly, transcendence. Inevitably, there's a lot that has been left out. Uh, I don't talk at all, for example, about popular music, which a lot could be said about um, Fuji or Tarab or a lot of, or Bandiri or other genres that, um, that include aspects of Muslim social life in popular music. But what I hope did come through in this chapter was to give some broader, maybe overlooked concepts through which we can think about Islamic Africa musically, whether it's through the intoned pedagogical interactions between generations or among women, whether it's in the relationships that are materialized in sound through Sufi associational life and the importance of those relationships in Africa's growing cities, or whether it's the ways that people experience legacies of trauma within a Muslim context, especially the traumas connected to the trans-Saharan slave trade. These examples should leave an impression that the cultural landscape of Islamic Africa is far more interconnected than is often acknowledged. North and Sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa, and the Swahili coast share more than a nominal connection to the same faith and its basic tenets. They share intellectual histories, pedagogical practices, associational forms and orientations to spirituality that are the product of centuries of mutual engagement between locales. A lot of this mutual engagement comes to the fore when we not only approach the topic of Islam in Africa with our eyes open, but with our ears open as well. Thank you. Well, Brendan has completed his conversation. I'm assuming, yes? Yes. That's so right. my my job is just to call the next person. Is Babaka here, please? Yep, he's here. Thank you, Babaka. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, let me let me introduce you, please. Yeah. For the benefit of those who do not know that you are from Senegal. <laughs> <laughs> But you are multilingual uh, with the capacity to converse in at least three languages. Uh, you went to school where my friends are, uh, Apollo Zungwangwa and some other people at Bowling Green. Uh, Bowling Green has some admirable PhD structures. I think it's the only one in the country which is um, based on the European model. You can finish in three years. I don't know whether that is the one he did. Um, and is um, known for his contribution to an African literature. So I was expecting him to ask um, Korea a question. Um, and he overlaps in the world of creativity uh doing black post-colonial and transnational never give me an opportunity I'll, as i will use it to do a commercial i just started a new series with bloomsbury on african aesthetics so i'm looking for manuscripts along um, creativity and other things if you have one and to my colleagues please press it around because the areas of creativity, poetry, songs, sometimes they find it difficult to publish on them. And Bloomsbury, as you, as you are aware, they publish the Harry Potter series. So it's a very famous publishing house. Uh, he wrote for Rutledge, and you may, know, you may be hearing for the first time that I was one of those who read this, that manuscript on black cosmopolitanism and anti-colonialism. I didn't know you, so there was no corruption uh, down there. Uh, and he followed it up with the um, Mississippi. The trickster comes west, Pan-African influence. Uh, so it's very well published and he quoted two other books. Uh, thank you very much, Babaka. Your chair is back. I think the chair is back in case he wants to take over again. Otherwise, you can continue. Yeah, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Olola. Uh, I had no clue uh, that you were the one, the scholar that read the uh, Black Cosmopolitanism that reviewed it from Routledge, but I was really impressed by that review and it really encouraged me um, uh, to just like uh, pursue the project. So thank you so much for those very insightful um, evaluations. So, um, and thank you very much to you also, and also to Professor Falun Gong and Professor Mustafa Kulfi for having really uh, produced this wonderful uh, book, the Palgrave Handbook of Islam in Africa. Uh, I feel really honored uh, to be included, to have been included into the project with such a great uh, contributors and editors. So um, I would like first to start with my kind of general interest in the, the broader topic in which I've been kind of involved for quite a long time since uh, my graduate school days at Bowling Green State University uh, when I was enrolled into the PhD program in American studies. You know, we didn't have a department uh, and I don't think that we still have a department of uh, American studies at Bowling Green. Uh, we have a program, so what we do is um, all the new graduate students are invited, encouraged to develop some kind of expertise uh, by drawing from at least a number of courses from other departments, at least uh, 15 credits, uh, five courses, um, and even more than that. So I had the opportunity to draw courses from ethnic studies uh, because ethnic studies had a program at the time. In fact, they, they, they even now a department. Uh, and I also drew some courses from the history department that I attended the most. Uh, I had about five courses from that department. And it was through my encounter uh, with those professors who taught those courses that I became aware of Africanisms, uh, African retentions, African cultural continuities and discontinuities. Um, and I remember a book that one of my professors, uh, Professor Lillian Ashcraft Eason assigned, and that was entitled Africanisms in American Culture by Joseph Holloway, it really opened up my eyes because for the first time I could hear or read the work of scholars, for instance, who were trying to figure out the African origins of yodeling you know, in, in country music in Southern United States or in other parts of the United States, uh, such as Kentucky, for instance, or Texas, uh, or for instance, like the African influences in African-American language. I remember Molifikete Asante had a piece, had an art, a chapter dealing just with that. Um, on African American vernacular, and and um, I think that course really um, made me become really sensitive as to what could be comparatively be considered as a form of uh, an Africanism when I read works of African American literature. So when I read Baldwin's work, uh, "Go Tell It on the Mountain," published in 1953, uh, the, the 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 scenery just like the descriptions and the, the communalism in the text and also the syncretisms within the, the narrative just reminded me of uh, religious chants in Senegal, uh, of communalisms in Senegal. Uh, and the same thing, when I read uh, the book of folklore of uh, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Mills and Men, um, you know, um, when I read the segment dealing with folk tale, uh, folklore, not folk tales, because half of it deals with, uh, is composed of uh, selections of folk tales, but half of that narrative, uh, Mills and Men, is composed of Zora Neale Hurston's own stories, remembrances of uh, her experiences with uh, uh, voodoo priests and priestesses uh, in New Orleans in the, in the, in the 1920s. So when I read that segment of Mills and Men dealing with folklore, I just, again, uh, began to really see the, the, the resemblance between um, the religious worshipings and forms of rituals that Hurston describes in that section and what I noticed in, in Senegal while kind of attending some nup ceremony, uh, you know, the uh, therapeutic wall of, uh, and also other African uh, forms of, uh, uh, religious worshipings and healings. And the same thing happened when I read uh, Daughters of the Dust, uh, which was initially uh, a film of uh, Julie Dash, and then later on transformed into a novel. 
um, that is the, the narrative that really reflects, I think, the most salient forms of Africanisms in African-American literature. Uh, but I don't still want to generalize, just to uh, really reiterate that excellent point that uh, Dr. Correa made earlier, you know, in his interest in uh, the refusal of categorization, but also in his search for complexity. I want to reiterate uh, those two elements, because those are the kind of models that I try to, to also emulate, which is a fact that, you know, when looking at the relationships between African and Black diasporan cultures and literatures, there are, one has to recognize both continuities and discontinuities, and one has to refuse or, I mean, uh, be wary uh, to have, I would say, a, a monolithic conception of Blackness, of Black cultures, even if we know that there are some generalities. And actually, I'm not the one making that argument. The first scholar uh, whose work uh, made that argument, I think, uh, uh, is John Mitty, uh, John S. Mitty, uh, in his two most known books, uh, Introduction to African uh, Philosophy, and I think uh, there's a book on African religion, although he wrote a lot of books on African religion. Uh, so I would, I'm just going to go ahead, because in the interest of time, because I know there are other presenters, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about what I would consider as African Islamic influences uh, in, in some of these literary texts. Just a few examples. Let's say uh, we, we take uh, Daughters in, uh, of the Dust uh, as an example. We can see there that Julie Dash depicts the, character, the characters of Daughter Island as people who strongly affirm their ties to their African ancestors in both America and Africa. This acknowledgement of the African past is visible in the novel's frequent allusions to African slaves who either brought Islamic practices to Daughter Island or gained them from their ancestors who had been enslaved in the United States. One of these Africans is a person that Elizabeth, the character of Elizabeth and her friend Septima call Paymore Muhammad, quote unquote, the old man who lived back up the Jameson Creek, end of quotation. The narrator states, a girl blurted out, him pay more scared me. He talked in the tongue all the time. I neither could tell what he talking about. Elizabeth corrected her. It was the tongue that the people talk in where he came from across the water. Paymore's words may have derived from Arabic. Paymore's last name, Muhammad, from Arabic Muhammad, shows that he may be a Muslim named after the Islamic prophet whose forename is written in many ways, such as Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. The literature on the Islamic presence in the Gullah Islands of South Carolina during the 19th century suggests that Paymore could have been a Muslim. In his book entitled Black Crescent, The Experience and Legacy of African Muslims in the Americas, published in 2005, Michael A. Gomez asserts, quote unquote, long viewed as a source and reservoir of Gala culture, it has become apparent that coastal islands such as Sapelo, St. Simons, St. Helena, and their environs were also the collective site of the largest gathering of African Muslims in early North America, establishing a legacy that continues into the present day." End of quotation. The African Muslims' presence in North America was also strong during the 19th century and the early 20th century. Scholars have found the presence of African Muslims who were brought to the United States as late as the last half of the 19th century. For instance, in his essay, Moving Beliefs, the Panama Manuscript of Sheikh Sana Si in African Diasporic Islam, published in 2003. The scholar Mustafa Bayoumi writes, Omar Ibn Said became relatively famous in the Carolinas of the 1850s. Ibrahim Abdul Rahman went on a national speaking tour sponsored by the American Colonization Society to raise money to return to his home in Timbo. And Sali Bilali was well known enough locally for Joel Chandler Harris to compose two books based on his existence. The story of Aaron, so named the son of Ben Ali published in 1896 and Aaron in the Wildwoods published in 1897. 
The autobiography of Omar Ibn Said, published in the American Historical Review of July 2020, uh, 1925, locates Said's origin to Futa Toro, also known as a Futa Toro in current northern Senegal. The article cites a manuscript in which Said describes his background in captivity, writing, my name is Omar Ibn Said. My birthplace was Futur between the two rivers. I sought knowledge under the instruction of a sheikh called Muhammad Said, my own brother, and Sheikh Sulaiman Kumbe, Kembe, and Sheikh Gabriel Abdel. I continued my studies 25 years and then returned to my home where I remained six years. Then there came to our place a large army who killed many men and took me and brought me to the Great Sea and sold me into the hands of the Christians who bound me and sent me on board a great ship and we sailed upon the Great Sea a month and a half when we came to a place called Charleston in the Christian language. The footnotes of the excerpts indicate that Futur refers to Futa Toro and Fadil to Fayetteville, North Carolina. These revelations show that African Muslims had a strong presence in the Carolinas where they brought in, where they were brought in situations similar to those of Said and Paymore. The evidence for such similitude is visible in Paymore's narration of the enslavement of his ancestors. Julie Dash writes, when Elizabeth had been a child, Paymore had kept a company with Nana, regaling them all with tales of his life in a place he called the Bilad as Sudan, from Arabic Bilad al Sudan, the country of the blacks. Even after the sale of Africans had been banned on the mainland, he and the other captives had been smuggled onto the island plantations from one to the many slave ships that hid in the shallow inlets of the Charleston shore. Many a time had Elizabeth and her brothers and sisters shivered while listening to the tales about the ships with red flags that waited until darkness to drive their band cargo ashore. It seemed that for every story about captives walking out onto the water or flying from the fields to begin their long trek back home, another story was told about slavers outrunning the law and hastily dumped bodies in chains washing up on the shore. So Paymore's gruesome narrative of kidnapping and torture of African slaves are consistent with Said's accounts of captivity and violence. So both Said and Paymore were sold in Charleston, demonstrating the important role that the Gala Island played as sites of dispersion of Africans into the United States. Uh, so in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna skip some of my discussion of uh, Afri uh, Islamic influences on uh, Julie Dash and Daughters of the Dust and just move on to uh, Hurston's Mills and Men. And there, I think one of the most salient types of African Islamic influences that I see in that narrative is Hurston's emphasis on the spiritual retreat. And this is a segment in which the character of Turner um, asked Hurston to isolate herself in a room for 69 hours. And Hurston describes this spiritual retreat as follow. Three days, my body must lie silent and fasting while my spirit went wherever spirits must go that seek answers never given to men as men. I could have no food but a pitcher of water." End of quotation. Hurston's isolation is a spiritual rite of passage. Hurston's seclusion is parallel to the West African Islamic practice known as halwa, a Sufi term. Halwa is an Islamic ritual in which a person retreats in loneliness in an attempt to seek knowledge from a higher power. Halwa had origins in, in traditional Sufi Islamic practices where it was used to allow individuals seeking knowledge to establish relationships with their creator without human interference. And there is a book entitled Journey to the Lord of Power, a Sufi manual on retreat, uh, Konya, Turkey, 1204, 1205 by Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi, uh, in which the scholar defines Halwa as the act of total abandonment in desire of the divine presence. And then the discussion goes forward there. Uh, so what I would like to do is to move on straight into, because I'm cutting quite a lot of material just so that uh, you know uh, my other colleagues uh, can have the time to also present their work. Um, so I'm gonna move on to 
Baldwin's book, novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and focus more on... Uh, so we do know here, just for his, as a historical reference, that uh, the awakening was an important historical moment for African-Americans uh, because the form of Christianity that that movement brought to them was more, created a more direct relationship between the individual and God, you know, in comparison, for instance, to the form of Christianity that the Puritanism brought uh, into the United States or the Anglican church brought to the United States. The awakening was, I would say, uh, created this very direct uh, kind of freedom that the African-American worshiper could have by creating this personal relationship with God. Uh, and this is a God that is not to be feared, right? This is a God that is very similar to the, uh, to the God of the Yoruba people, you know? This is a God that's very similar to the God of the Igbo people. You know, this is a God that's very similar to the types of, I mean, uh, uh, deities within traditional African cultures. You know, uh, these are gods you can even, and goddesses uh, with whom you can even be playful, you know, and John S. Mitty does explain all those different dynamics in his work. So, uh, so similar to the Baptist tradition and similar to the uh, Protestant tradition and specifically American Protestant tradition and specifically similar to the, to the Great Awakening, uh, one thing that can be noticed in African-American religiosity, especially uh, in the one that uh, Baldwin describes in Gotel on the Mountain, is the, the permanence or the commonality of trances, you know, uh, spiritual trances. Uh, even if this kind of trance can be traced to uh, African-American baptism, uh, uh, it can uh, also have uh, analogy or it can be uh, uh, compared and contrasted with the kind of possessions that take place over, over the, that, that take over the participants in West African Islamic Sufi chants known as Jang, you know, and I was glad that uh, my colleague uh, Brandon uh, just talked, uh, Kibi, uh, Professor Dr. Brandon Kibi just talked about some of them, gave us like a number of examples of these religious chants in African societies. In Senegal, these night chants are, uh, no, I mean, or, or just in general, these night chants are centuries old rituals in which Muslim congregations in Africa are joined in sequences of singing, crying, worshiping, and dancing that may last all night long. The revivals are similar to the ones in which the character of Gabriel Grimes in Go Tell It on the Mountain and his parishioners participate in a series of songs, dance, trance, and rituals. And more evidence of the similarity between West African Islamic rituals and the Christian performance in Go Tell It on the Mountain is visible in the praise singing and spirit worshiping that Baldwin describes in the novel. For instance, depicting the praise singing and spirit worshiping in the scene in which the character of John is on the threshing floor, Baldwin states, quote unquote, the silence in the church ended when brother Elisha, kneeling near the piano, cried out and fell backward under the power of the Lord. Immediately, two or three others cried out also, and a wind a foretaste of that great downpouring they awaited swept the church. With this cry and the echoing cries, the tarry service moved from its first stage of steady murmuring, broken by moans, and now and again an isolated cry into that stage of tears and groaning, of calling aloud and singing, which was like the labor of a woman about to be delivered of a child. On this threshing floor, the child was a soul that struggled to the light, and it was the church that was in labor, that did not cease to push and pull, calling on the name of Jesus. When brother Elisha cried out and fell back crying, sister McCandless rose and stood over him and helped him to help him pray. For the rebirth of the soul was perpetual. Only rebirth every hour could stay the hand of Satan. Sister Price began to sing, I want to go through, Lord, I want to go through. Take me through, Lord, take me through. The scene reflects the influence of African American Christianity on Go Tell It. Professor Barker, Professor Barker, 
can we wind up in, in two minutes, please? So yes, can, yes, uh, yes, I will. Yes, interested. this is the last, this is the last right. instance. This is the last right, instance. So the actions described in the passage are examples of the African-American religious and vernacular traditions known as testifying. From a religious sense, testifying is a moment of spiritual awakening in which the African-American worshipers enters into a state of trance or possession, expressing his or her true belief in God and his or, or her strong desire to have privileged relationships with him, uh, as visible in Brother Elisha's act of falling under the power of the Lord. You know, other examples that I could give, for instance, from uh, Gautier on the Mountain, uh, include the call and response. Hmm? Uh, they would, could also include, uh, you know, uh, I would say, uh, the, uh, the musical, you know, a representation, for instance, like uh, of, uh, of, of the passage, you know, like of, of the connections between the individual and the divine power, you know. Um, and I argue that uh, uh, one thing that we could do in a scholarship is to draw from Senegalese popular music, you know, um, uh, and also uh, some of the examples of, uh, I would say, musical traditions that one can find in the Sufi brotherhoods in Senegal. Uh, so uh, it's almost like a few years ago, I was somewhat anticipating or thinking about uh, sources, musical sources that are very similar to those that Dr. K uh, Brandon Kibi, you know, talked about. So I can definitely see the connections between uh, what I said and uh, what Dr. Kibi is talking about. Uh, uh, so we do have a strong body of scholarship produced by scholars such as Michael A. Gomez, uh, scholars such as John Stone Roberts, uh, Joseph Holloway, et cetera, uh, who have already demonstrated the fact that uh, there are connections between uh, Senegambian and African literary and cultural traditions and the values and the customs of the Africans who had been enslaved into the United States and other parts of the diaspora. You know, now what's lacking is uh, a scholarship that can connect the literary traditions, the cultures of those descendants and also of those enslaved Africans and their parallels in, in, in Africa. Now, now how, how, how does one go about it? One, one possibility is to look at these connections as evident in the similar cosmologies, you know, in the similar, uh, I would say, sounds, in the similar music, in the similar, uh, I would say, philosophies, religious beliefs, um, uh, and also how they can be uh, also demonstrated through uh, textual comparisons. You know, so we will have the chance to talk more about this during the discussions. Uh, so that was just like a, a few points that I wanted to make uh, in the interest of time. Thank you so very much, Professor Baraka. Um, so uh, because of time, we will not be able to allow you to continue. Otherwise, it's a very fascinating and interesting uh, presentation. Uh, one of the things I, I thought I may want to uh, not so that probably at the Q&A session, you will respond to that. Would be, That's right. Um, you see, uh, from my own experience, when I first started in the US in 2008, for my second master's at Ohio University, I it was my first experience. I never knew that uh, there was this kind of uh, this agreement or sort of this understanding between what I can call native Africans like me who travel all the way to the US and African Americans. You know, despite let's say I was a Muslim and you know I, I ran into some Muslims, and I started realizing there was this huge disagreement. And so I, I was wondering how you know you view either Islam uh, 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 within the context of uh, the survival, preservation, and transmission of these things you're talking about uh, in terms of either bringing together uh, Muslims in diaspora and those other uh, mm -hmm. African continent. So, but uh, let's reserve that probably when it comes to the Q&A session. Uh, now we will we'll have to move to uh, Professor Omar Gray who is uh, going to be presenting, and his topic is Islam and activism, 
the Marabut and the trade union. Uh, by in, uh, let me just make a little introduction of uh, Professor Omar. He is a professor of history at Sheikh Anshad Diouf University in Dakar, Senegal. Uh, his work focuses on labor and social history. He holds a PhD in social history from the University of Amsterdam, a PhD in modern and contemporary history from Sheikh Anshad Diouf University. Professor Omar was a fellow at the Weatherhead Initiative on Global History at Harvard University, a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Michigan, a Fennan uh, Brodel Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy, a Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies of Paris, and an Associate Studies Director at uh, Maison, de, Maison de Sciences in Paris. He's a contributor in several collective volumes and has recently published uh, May 1978 in Senegal, in which he analyzes the African specificity in the global social movement. He is currently working on the relationship between trade unionism and politics and the audacity of African youth since the uh, 60s. Uh, uh, I want to request the pleasure of uh, Professor Omar to try to be processed. I mean, you know, there's so much out there, I would really love to uh, hear from you, but. Uh, uh, if you can uh, make a presentation in 15 to 20 minutes, that would be greatly appreciated. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, congratulations to Falu and uh, Toyin. Toyin, I see the first for the first time. And uh, also, I want to say thanks for joining me to the project. I'm very proud of it. It gave me the opportunity to, to write about uh, Islam and religion in general. The first part of my work was uh, labor, labor history. But through this, this research, I got many crossroads that led me to the study of Islam, to the study of women, to the study of child work, politics, and now I um, define myself more than um, a social historian because of all the interests I've seen in my road. And uh, today I'm talking about uh, Islam and uh, just about uh, through three examples of strikes, but I can do more. And my idea is now to, to, to do a bigger paper than the one published now in this handbook. And again, many thanks to Fallo and Tony for this opportunity. Um, for the title, I let it open because for the first time I was thinking about talking uh, about uh, these two main actors, the Marabu and the Unionist, um, peacemakers versus troublemakers, peacemakers considering Marabu as it was seen by colonial administration and later by uh, the new independence set. Troublemaker talking about unionists and it might be controversial. As I could say also, accommodation versus resistance. Accommodation is a concept very well discussed by um, late, uh, um, late uh, James Suring and also uh, David Robinson concerning the Marabu and resistance concerning also the workers' the strikes. And that was kind of many uh, topics I could tackle, but for now, I just have to talk about uh, the Marabu and uh, the, and just a few words to summarize my paper. Hmm? And the chapter examines uh, the role of Islam and Muslims actors in social movement in French West Africa. And I study the case of uh, Senegal because of many reasons. First of all, the number of Marabu and its early experiment with unionization due to the early French presence and the participation of the Africans of the four communes. You know that we have four cities in Senegal considered work, uh, four cities in Senegal who were considered French citizens. That's Rufisk, my home city, Dakar, Gore, and Rufisk. 
But through this journey, two major actors emerges. They are the Marabu and the trade union. They led significant sections of the populations, the peasants first, the workers second, and mostly after independence, the students. And the interactions between these two types of leaders was crucial in the mobilizations for the defense of the interests of the population. This mobilization centers on workers' rights on the one hand, and the social political fight for national interests in the construction of the post colonial states. As leaders of the most representative and most structured social entities, the Marabu and the trade unionists had the tacit vocation of fighting for the interests of the followers from whom they drew their legitimacy, the same way elected politicians did. Significant struggle fought within the framework of the trade unions created a wave of discontinuity and reform the evolution of the colonial and post colonial space. The actors who took part of the struggle came from various professions and mostly from multiple nationalities. The chapter will then show the continuity of the interplay between activism, religion, and state during two historical contexts, the colonial one and the post-colonial through a series of compelling examples. For the colonial area, I will discuss the railroad workers' strike of September 1938 in Chess, Senegal, and the Dakar Niger Railway Workers Strike of 1947-1948, described by uh, Usman Semben. Somebody talked about him this morning. And finally, the strike of May 1968 through the worldwide social movement in the world in Dakar, who will discuss the post colonial context. And that will be a uh, moment to highlight the role played by the Marabu who intervened in the highest level of the political sphere during the crisis. During uh, all this time, we've got these uh, caliph generals, the most uh, highest standing of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muridia, the Tijaniya, who were involved in finding peace through this tribal moment. The actions of Mustafa Mbake will be highlighted, the caliph of the Muridia, as well as his successor, Sering Fallu Mbake, Sering Baba Kasi for the Tijaniya, and his successor, Abdul Aziz Si, as well as Seyed Murutal, the influential Tijan Marabu will serve as his. On the one hand, the essay shows the contrast between the almost unconditional support that Next president, Leopold Sedar Senghor, a Christian, enjoyed from Muslim leaders while the Catholic Church supported his opponent during significant crisis, as illustrated in the events of uh, 1968. That was kind of a very controversial part. I talk about uh, the accommodation versus resistance, but here after independence, we've got in a country where uh, 95 percent of the population are composed by Muslims, a Christian president. And another irony is, every time we got into trouble, the Muslims supported Christian president against other Muslims, his competitors. And this kind of a specificity of uh, Senegal. Then we have these three main actors: the Marabu, the trade unionist and they said a brief word in, about the Marabu, who is an ancient figure in Senegambia. He has been an active actor in traditional administrative structures from pre-colonial time until the spread of Islam and the advent of the Safi Brotherhood, Sufi Brotherhood, sorry. The Marabu's power increased with the demise of the traditional influence of the Chedo. 
he became the primary interlocutor of the colonial administration due to his status of leader of a significant number of believers. Marabou's influence would extend beyond organizing rural communities through Quranic education and farming. It would become significant in electoral process after the post-World War reform of the Union Francaise. Thus, many sought out the Marab for political alliance, especially after the suppression of the indigenous status system gave rights of citizenship to the community. The importance of the Marabu grew for his role as a spiritual guide, he added the status of influencer of the voting behaviors of these new voters who followed by his instruction, especially after the reforms of 1946. The Marabu, who was an economic entrepreneur for his contribution to the production of peanuts, the main cash crop of colonial Senegal became a political entrepreneur. He turned into the new king of inter interland, the king of the bush, whose friendship and political alliance, in particular, the main actors of the political arena sought after. The Marabu established himself as a central figure who, beside his religion and political influence, could play a significant role as a mediator during all sorts of social crises between regular citizens, citizens, sorry, or between the government and his followers. For the second actor, the trade union, it became an, an organized sector early on, thanks to different work regimes that helped the local labor to mobilize and allow Africans to get involved in civil affairs as early as the beginning of colonization. Mostly in Senegal, where the French presence was very early, Africans quickly learned the theories of and methods of trade union activities as they encountered the European colleagues in construction sites, civil service, and career training school. The avant-garde position allowed African trade unionists to spearhead the struggle for social reform despite the legal restrictions that, present, that prevented them from enjoying the right to unionize in a colonial system with a rigorous administration. And from there, the workers mobilized in the name of the slogan, equal pay for equal work. Why it is important? At the time, we got the Union Francaise who uh, replaced the former French Empire. It was just a semantic change. But the reality remained the same. And the workers, even if they did not get the right to, to unionize, took this advantage to ask equality with the, uh, with the, with the European, the French fellows. That means equal pay for equal work. That was a, a demand which could not be satisfied in a colonial context. And from there, they understood that what they demand could never have, uh, could never have uh, 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 a real satisfaction until they get uh, free. That means independence, even at the time they did not use the word and something was uh, running around the man. The slogan is also the, the rally cry that attracted their non-unionized African counterparts who identified with the struggle for equality of all citizens of the French Union. Thus, the trade union leaders were able to back the aura they drew from the significant battles 
they fought before and after World War II. They translated the activism into political parties during the struggle for national liberation and later for nation building. The point is here, um, the general population identified it themselves to the workers' fight because what they were demanding concerned more generally all the population. And uh, that's how the strike they did long, they, uh, lasted very long because of this support. Um, the second uh, example I'll give later was- uh, yeah, um, Professor, Professor, we'll be mindful of the time. In the next uh, four minutes, I would like you to wind up. In four minutes, I would really like you to wind up and sort of uh, give us some kind of uh, Okay. Summary of that. So that when the, when it comes to the question and answer session, okay, I'm shifting. Uh, okay. Yeah, the junction that I'm I'm going straight to the junction between the Marabu and the Union took effect through the mass of workers of Tizen origin who were simultaneously under the tutelage, and therefore were influenced and mobilized by both the Marabu and the Union, depending on the circumstances. As a result. The issues of interest to the workers concern both the union and the Marabu, directly or indirectly. The colonial administration and later the post-colonial state had clearly perceived this problem and did not hesitate to resort to the mediation of the Marabu to solve problems with trade unions in various contexts. They always ask the implication of the religious guide explicitly or implicitly whenever the state or the socio-political um, balance was at risk. Regarding labor relations, Marabu supported the state administration was acquired. On the one hand, because the colonial authorities ended up pacifying their relations with the Marabu movement, and on the other hand, because of the tri tri triumphant alliance between the new social partners, of social of post colonial Senegal, President Senghor and the King Isma Bush are the example. In contrast, unions have always depended on themselves to fight for the demands without any allegiance to the Marabu, despite a power imbalance unfavorable to them whenever a conflict broke out. The various trade unions have involved the King of the Bush and the trade unionists, vital social actors since the post-war period. Successive interference and games of interest led to a junction and or opposition between the social organization through the masses they control, the workers and the peasants, in the nationalist mobilization of the, social, of the colonial territories and later the new independent state. The May 1968 world, so, uh, worldwide social movement is another case in Senegal that prolonged the relationship between Marabu and strikes. The public authorities, after political independence, use the same strategy for the intervention of varying degree of um, success as during the social crisis discussed in the following session. Um, as a result, they have a long tradition of intervening in social con conflicts in general and trade unions negotiations in particular. Indeed, the king of the bush, the Marabu, had power of persuasion of the majority of the population composed of Muslims who had a great deal of respect, alliance, allegiance, and obedience to him. His role went beyond convincing voters in favor of giving a candidate during electoral competition or mobilizing people for various causes. He turned into a social mediator, especially in the case of an individual or collective dispute when he would intervene to help self uh, find issues. Um, I'm gonna shift the example of uh, the railway strike and the also strike uh, that obey to a simple principle that every time the administration are in uh, is in trouble 
facing the demands of workers, they uh, call the Muslim guide to try to convince uh, the strikers to go to work. Of course, the strikers did not accept all these uh, positions. And oh, during all those uh, strikes, um, they gave a negative answer to the social media, the, the Marabou. And mostly in uh, 1968, so we got this trouble between uh, the Catholic president Senghor and uh, his co uh, and, and, and the other part of the his pro, his church, uh, the Catholics, because we see for the first time in 1968 the Christian Church support the strikers against the Christian president. At the same time, the Marabou call for the call for work and ask to the strikers to go back to work. Of course, they refuse. And that's how the Marabou were often ob objective allies of the regimes that legitimated the Marabou's power of intermediation and that did not hesitate to rely to them, to ease tensions within labor relations. Um, let me go straight to the conclusion. So, in one minute, please. Yeah. Okay. In the same way, the political actors saw alliance with Marabou as a way to be favorable, favorably seen by the disciples, in particular during election competition. The involvement of Marabou in the social political process of the colonial state first and the post colonial state later was not a new phenomenon. It was justified by the fact that significant section of the population follow the instructions of the Marabou. It follows a logic of collaboration of Marabou who have remained loyal to the states since the time that the colonial armies quelled armed resistance and defeated Marabou's, uh, Marabou's warriors. And as well as the case of the involvement of the Marabou in union's action was intended to twist the arms of the strikers or at least to convince them to adopt opposition strikers. Be they Muslim and deceived of the Marabou, the workers distrusted the religion readers. In 1938, 1947, 48, in 1968, the persistent pressure for the Marabouts ended up alienating workers who openly expressed their dissatisfaction. Finally, by presenting themselves as social mediators, which were useful for the central government, the Marabou reinforced their social legitimacy. Action such as these was built around the role as economic entrepreneur, political entrepreneur, grand elector, and spiritual guide. Through many example sites of proceeding discussion, we note discrepancies between Marabous and trade unions. In other words, between Muslim guides and their followers, that was so because what was at stake was not religion but interest. Islam has undoubtedly been the common denominator between the Marabou and most activists who referred the term to them as spiritual guides. However, 
Marabu tended to act as political entrepreneur. In the very situation of crisis in which they intervene, they intervene. However, like the allies, state officials, the Marabu have struggled to domesticate the union, a growing counterpower that continues to challenge the political establishment. So I'm gonna stop here. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Omar. Uh, a very interesting uh, conversation. Whenever I hear uh, discussions about uh, relationship between state and religion, I always find it really um, interesting, especially when it comes to Senegal, because uh, here is a West African country like Nigeria, but basically what you find is a totally different from what is obtainable in, 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 in uh, the uh, Anglophone. Uh, probably uh, when it comes to the question and answer session, whether you will respond to some of the uh, issues that uh, actually have led to why it remains problematic between uh, uh, either the, 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 the Marabout as resistant or uh, looking at the other party as uh, uh, people who accommodate who are peacemakers in order to actually make makers talking about the the the, the uh unionists. Uh, so let's let's uh, move to the last part which basically sort of uh, brings us to a kind of uh, theoretical or kind of uh, what will put all we've been talking about in terms of uh, Islam modernity and 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 and, and, and uh, the world views in 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 in, in perspective. Now we'll be looking into uh, a framework of uh, how how uh, uh, digital media and Islam play out in, in Africa. And uh, our last speaker is uh, Professor Ibrahim Abu Sharif. Let me very briefly introduce him. Uh, Professor uh, Ibrahim. Abu Shari is an associate professor in the journalism and strategic communication program at Northwestern University in Qatar. He holds a postgraduate degree in journalism and a doctorate in religious and Islamic studies. His academic interests include the intersections of religion and media, particularly digital media and religious authority. His scholarly work also includes the origins uh, promulgation and effects of key journalistic framing terminologies used in prominent Western print, me, uh, print news or print news sources in covering Middle East and North African events and ongoing affairs. Uh, Professor Ibrahim Abu Sharif. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, the topic of his uh, presentation, uh, or the title of his work, was uh, researching digital media and Islam in Africa, recommending a framework. So that was what he had for our uh, handbook yeah. of Islam in Africa, but he's at liberty to sort of uh, uh, expand his discussion revolving around the subject matter. Okay, thank you very much. I'm assuming you could hear me. Is, is that right? Is that accurate? Yes, we can. Yeah, you go ahead. Okay, very good. So let me just begin where we all have begun, and that is with gratitude. I'm grateful for the organizers and Duke University for putting this together, and I'm particularly grateful for the editors who I've never seen before, but I know of their work, their professionalism, and their scholarship, and most of all, their patience in the production has been extraordinary and something I will remember, and I'm honored to be part of this work. But another prefatory comment, I'm in Chicago now, and there's a storm moving over my in the south of the city where I'm at, and I got a couple notices that my internet is unstable, and hopefully um, I will not have a problem with that now. So let me share my screen. Um, again, I want to confirm. Do you see the do you see the the slides? We can see that you are planning. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we can. We can, yes, we can now. All right. Okay, very good. 
And so my, my, my chapter is an exploratory chapter about researching digital, digital media and Islam in Africa. Uh, I've been studying Islam and digital media for many years in, in different uh, aspects. So when I was um, asked to participate in this, in this gracious volume, I thought about a couple of my own experiences in Senegal, which raised questions that I felt in my mind needed to be answered. And so the arc of today's presentation, I, and I, I want to go through this with some kind of pace in order to not be interrupted uh, by, by the storm. And that is, I wanna talk about what do we mean by digital media and the key points of this chapter, and then talk about why am I recommending religious authority as a framework. Um, and so my chapter serves to introduce, problematize, and recommend, and this will become clearer to you as, as I go further on, but it's all centered on the question is, how do you think about new media and religion and religion research when it's combined with area studies? Because there are two different and seeming competing different ideations of space here. And so on one hand, uh, you, um, the question that I think naturally comes up is when we just uh, study Islam and digital media, are we talking about the study of devices? Are we studying about circuitry or are we talking about instrumentality, mobility and conveyance of religious content? Are we talking about scriptural, charismatic and ethical and juridical nodes of authority? Uh, but one thing that, uh, that I am trying to be cautious about almost everywhere I speak about this and that is we use the phrase digital media has changed, digital media has affected, digital media has influenced. This is a phrase of convenience, uh, and I'm gonna use it in this presentation, but one thing that I also like to keep at the forefront, that digital media does not operate from a moral premise. It does not have ethical guidelines. It is something that we human beings who are, who do have mukallifin, that we are loci of obligations and responsibility. And all that we see happening with digital media is actually, the, the usages of people, their graces and their flaws, you know, their nefarious deeds and their, their awesome deeds. So this is uh, something that uh, I think would be very good to keep in mind. And so negotiating complex spaces. Uh, one hand, Africa, we all know what Africa is. Uh, most of you know better than I do, but it's land, it's topography, it is people, it is a vast geographical... <laughs> Uh, vast linguistic and historical, cultural and sovereign distinctions. But digital spaces, on the other hand, are deterritorialized, they're transnational, they're meta-sovereignty, they're individualistic, less and not so much communal. And number one, and probably the best uh, or the, the most effective one is it, it is highly disruptive. <laughs> Um, as such, uh, the study of digital media and digital space needs to be unpacked. And by disruption, uh, disruption, um, it's, I'm being a little bit distracted by the conversation. It's, uh, professor, yeah, professor I, th Omar, professor Omar, I think somebody you, hasn't you, muted themselves. Yeah. Can you please no mute your microphone as well as others, please? Thank you. Professor Omar Green. Right, I think it's uh, Professor Kurfi that, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I don't know. I don't know, maybe he's something more, he's saying something more interesting than I am, so maybe. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, know. I was I was actually trying to tell uh, Professor Omar Gay to mute his mic. Okay, no, yeah, no but uh, you yes, can you. email him, yeah. Julie, Julie, you should just mute everyone. Yeah, that's also possible. Except actually. me, oh, okay. Yeah, Julie can yeah, mute everyone one. except the yes. speaker. All right. Should I go ahead now? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Can Julie mute everyone? Just mute everybody except automatically mute everybody. Except uh, the speaker. Yeah, Professor Brown, go ahead. Professor, he's looks like he's mute. Uh, sorry for that. 
But anyhow, one, one way to talk about uh, uh, digital media is to speak about disruption. Disruption basically means the ability or the capacity of digital media allowing people to become content producers with very little expense and relative ease. And this includes those who ostensibly are religious scholars, but sometimes they don't have the credentials, but it's difficult to know if they are credentialed to say what they're saying and to speak as they speak. So this is one of the disruptions of digital media. And also uh, content producers have access to audiences that were previously out of reach. And of course, speed and ubiquity, we always talk about that. But I think what is key is, is mediatization or mediatized changes, which means that Digital media is more than conveying information from one point to another. It actually, it actually ch is an agent of change of key institutions in society, including religion. Um, yeah, let me just get down here. So an important and expanding framework in religion, dig digital media studies is religious authority. And so let's just think about authority and power in, in a more general framework. Uh, you have religious authority, you have political authority. Please think about the previous administration using social media effectively for political gaming. And, it's, and this is all part of the disruption of digital media. But also think about economical disruptions. Think about Bitcoin, which is destabilizing the traditional notion of And since the main conceit of digital media studies is the notion that mediatization uh, of mediatization is that, as I mentioned, that digital media are agents of change in society. Now, how did I come to, to write about Senegal and Sufism at the Sulwuf? Um, so it happened very interestingly. There's always a forensics for how we ultimately decide what to do and what to research. And some of it is, uh, I wouldn't say accidental, I think it's inspired by, by experiences. So I, I remember being, you know, flying into Dakar and then taking a ride from Dakar to Colac, Medina Bay uh, in, in Senegal. It's about a four, four or five hour ride. I noticed that the closer we got to Medina Bay, there were more photos and images of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. They became more noticeable. You saw them in businesses, billboards, Perhaps it is for the Baruch, that is to, to gain uh, blessings. But his imprint, his legacy, his spiritual heirs committed to photography and drawn images on walls also were seen, uh, as I noticed, on iPhones. And there are many iPhones that had these images. And I think there's more to it than simply admiration. Perhaps this is also intent to have the Baruch or to be reminded of, of, the, of the legacy of Sheikh Ibrahim and his current heirs in the Tijani order. And so in the Tijani order in Sufism, as I've, as I've learned it, it has an emphasis on living scholars and shiyukh. I mean, the spiritual heirs of Sheikh Ibrahim and their flexibility with sacred communication raised interesting questions about digitality and the sacred. Like it, it's, of course, it's very important for to be in the presence of the Sheikh and having you know, an access to embodied knowledge but is digitality now? With embodied and disembodied knowledge and informed by, you know, the extraordinary scholars, some one is here uh, about the uh, about the distinction between embodied and disembodied, uh, and disembodied knowledge when it comes to sacred information, charismatic information. Professor Wright, Professor Ware, and many others have written about this and their work in, it has informed my understanding of, uh, of this and which was very pivotal. So let me give you a couple examples uh, to make this less abstract. Um, I know of a couple real examples where someone would call Sheikh uh, Tijani the uh, Sisi, who was a grandson of Sheikh Ibrahim, would call him because uh, from far away, and they would need some kind of uh, 
you know, you know, they have some kind of dilemma that they want the sheikh uh, can perhaps help them with. And so the sheikh would then send a prayer if, if this is what he felt was appropriate through WhatsApp or through messaging, through PDF. And, and so basically we're getting PDFs of prayers through digitality. And the question that came into my mind, what's, what's at play here? And because it's in the handwriting of the sheikh and you have amulets as well. And so the question is, is this embodied or disembodied or is it necessarily disembodied because you are not there? Well, it, co it comes back to the whole notion of idin, which is permission. If the sheikh, if in, in this is my understanding, gives you permission to receive this prayer this way, there is still something embodied about that, about that relationship, about that. And so let me give you another example, real example. Uh, someone who called the sheikh and say, you know, I have, a, I have an issue, I need some I need some special knowledge about this or prayers and, and so forth. And then the sheikh would say, I will give this to you, but you must come to Senegal before I give it to you. And I've seen that before as well. And so it, it seems to be not a question of technology. It seems to be a question of idin, uh, of permission. And this permission, if, uh, if one if we have an emic understanding of Sufism, if and we a phenomenological understanding of Sufism, ontological understanding of Sufism, that there is something about the sheikh giving someone permission that really gaps distance. And perhaps this is one of the conceits. These are important issues that I myself notice when uh, in my several visits to Senegal and being around the shiuch there, I, I, I it, you know, it raised a research uh, question in my mind. And so the essential questions that my chapter raised um, are, are as follows, and I want to read it, and that traditional paradigms of knowledge production and transmission seem to be at odds with an increasingly media-inflected age in which mobile devices and other digital technologies have marginalized or are seemingly marginalized traditional learning in, in West Africa. Uh, to frame it in another unpolished but familiar query, can YouTube or Facebook, the products of young, brash entrepreneurs, denizens of the secular modernity, uh, now serve as tools in conveying sacred knowledge that beforehand was available mainly through the teachings and the presence of living sheikh? These are important questions. Uh, they're, they're research agenda questions. And in broader terms, does social media necessarily represent a threat or challenge to, to traditional knowledge transition and religious authority? And can technology serve as a transference of charismatic meaning as traditionally conceived? This chapter poses these questions, what I hope to be part of a larger research agenda that I will pursue. And I will talk about some of the other things that, that I'm working on, but uh, these are not simple questions. There, there isn't a single answer. I'm not gonna pretend there is one and there could be conflict, conflicting um, understandings of how this all works. But I think that these are important understandings about sacred transition of knowledge and technology because technology is ubiquitous. Uh, we, we, are, we are plugged in almost all the time. The first things we do when we wake up, usually almost everybody's, we check our emails and see what happened. It is part of our lives. But the ease with which we use technology, we use digital media products, and we use it very well, and we, we don't even think about it, the interface is seamless, that doesn't mean we understand what it's doing. Being able to use something very well and seamlessly does not answer the question of how is this changing society? How is it changing scholarship? How is it changing our relationship with the sacred? It doesn't, these are two different conversations and ease can be deceptive in saying, well, I know what's happening while we don't know what's happening. And we know what's happening only through some kind of uh, research uh, um, agenda. And so I, I want to end with a couple of things here and that is the perils of change scholarship. You know, many of us, we, we, we research um, things today and compare them with the past. When it comes to digital media scholarship, and obviously digital media is a watershed moment, it did change things, but I'm cautioning about exaggerating the bifurcation between the past, present, now, and then. It's kind of a hazard to think that everything that's happening now never happened in the past. I think this is part of the modernity project where we think that modernity is extraordinary and uh, is, is unique. And it's while modernity has a very hostile reaction to pastness, to the past. 
So we have to keep that in mind. Technology's influence and perceived threats on religious authority is centuries old. Let's think about the printing press in the, in the late uh, 1400s. It was extolled by the Protestant revolutionaries and it was demonized by the established church fathers. And I mean, they use religious language to extol the printing press because it decentralized church teachings and it was demonized by the established church fathers because it destabilized their authority. And I think that this notion of destabilizing authority has not, uh, it, is, it continues to be an important part of digital media studies. And digit digitality is a watershed moment, but it cannot be severed from historical communication uh, of, of technology and their events in the past. And finally, there's a temptation, and I think we're influenced by, uh, as a side point, because I do study Salafi, Sufi contestations online, and I've become very familiar with the, the main And, and the temptation should be resisted to look at a religious authority today, uh, to look at religious authority today and then um, have a sort of singular understanding of the past. Um, so why religious authority? It's the flexibility of research is obvious. It's, it's mainly qualitative, but you can do ethnographic textual discourses. And by text, I mean print, orality, visual art, even, even gestures. And it can be case studies of luminaries of uh, these shiuch or the manuscripts or Sufi orders or uh, communities broadcast, for example. And of course, the, these religious authority responds to and re is respectful as a framework of area studies and their particularities. It does not have a hegemonic purpose. It's not meant to erase an understanding of West Africa, for example, or of Africa from Africanists. What it does is complement it. And, and many, I was interested uh, to hear and very happy to hear many of the points that were made in this conference, uh, people introduced topics that at their heart are matters of authority. We talked yesterday, it was about sacred music and poetry recitation in which aesthetics uh, transferred through digital media is, uh, is an epistemology, it is a pedagogy, you know, uh, beauty, uh, you know, there's a sense of beauty, but then there's a beauty of sense because they, they're, they're combined. And Quranic uh, melodic recitation, Mujawad, uh, there are hundreds of reciters available online. And I think yesterday we talked uh, about the, the obligation to recite the Quran melodically. Laysa minna man lam yataghanna bil Quran. He is not with us. He is not among us who does not recite or even sing that's a literal translation of the Quran. And so basically this, this, the aesthetics of reciting the Quran is part of the tafsir of the Quran, is part of the exegetical experience with the Quran. And so yesterday we all talked about manuscripts and, and, and increasingly manuscripts are becoming digitized and all the perils and also the graces involved with that. And someone mentioned today earlier, women scholars in public sphere, extremely important, but the public sphere has expanded drastically in the, in the digital media age and calligraphy. Uh, the gentleman showed us uh, pictures of, of beautiful calligraphy. I mean, honestly, I, I want to not steal, but I want to borrow his slides because those images were extraordinary. And however, how do we see them? We saw this in a conference that's being held and we're all represent different places around the world is being zoomed, which is its own uh, pedagogy. But again, it just by looking at that, literally speaking, I became inspired and he mentioned joy, beauty, humility. So uh, those are important things. And also the hegemonic spread of Salafi Wahhabiya via digital media, which I think after the Arab Spring, we saw there was an uptick in Salafi Wahhabi attacks on Sufi shrines. And that is mainly because a lot of countries were destabilized and you had this ability for uh, Salafi ideology, jihadists uh, for, for the most part around the world responding to the similar digital media texts. So this is a very uh, also uh, important part of what, uh, what I think my studies are. So for me, I, 
I, I believe that religious authority uh, can be and should be expanded the traditional Weaver and uh, Weberian nodes of authority. Uh, and they invite multidisciplinary research. I think it's very important to know that when you study digital media and religion, it's important to lead with religious studies as a discipline rather than media studies, because this way you will get the nuances of texts that we're studying that cannot be known unless you know the text. And you get that not by, by media studies, you get that by Islamic studies or religious studies. And then you have a plethora of unmasked forums and identity negotiations that are happening without parents, without families, without societies. This is all happening uh, through digital uh, mediation. And one wonders uh, in my research, how does that work? And then I'm also very interested in looking at popular culture and Muslim productions, aesthetics as power and strategic advocacy. It's unli unlimited by books and lectures and in particular spaces. Uh, this is actually a very interesting phenomena that's going on right now. And finally, I'm writing a book right now on social media, religious authority, and the recent Gulf crisis. And I'm saying recent in quote marks because no one really knows if it's really done uh, because we, there could be some, some kind of issues that will pop up. But I'm, I'm currently writing a, man, a monograph on that uh, under contract. And what, what I saw in social media of, of, uh, of influencers of the Gulf uh, and scholars of the Gulf who tweet in Arabic, uh, their advocacy of their very size of the Gulf crisis, and they're using religious language, while the Gulf crisis, and everybody knows this, is entirely political. It is not a religious dispute. It is a political dispute, but it does not stop the authorities and scholars of the region using the religious language to advocate their sides. So anyhow, I, I want to say that, um, um, thank you. Uh, again, I'm honored. I'm not an Africanist, but I think someone just texted me and said, I'm officially one and I'm honored if that's true. Uh, it's, it was really great to hear everybody and, um, Thank you so much. And if there's, I said a lot and, and I tried to rush through it. It's still a little bit thundering outside, but if anyone would like to ask questions, I, I'd be honored to, to receive them. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Ibrahim Abu Sharif. Uh, again, I do not know what the uh, organizers will say about this. Much the same way you appreciated uh, Professor Abdullah Abbas' uh, presentation, we are equally humbly requesting you to. Uh, make available your own uh, PowerPoint presentation. Very interesting and uh, very educated. Uh, uh, we have actually taken so much time listening to these very educative and uh, uh, interesting talks. Uh, one thing I just want to, there are so many things to talk about, but uh, I don't want to go into everything, but I really like the aspect you talked about uh, towards the end of your presentation where you talk about uh, the aesthetic of the setting of the Quran. Many people actually do not really bring it in context that even 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 the way and manner one recites the Quran in a musical manner is also in line with what the Prophet said, Laysa minna man la Quran. You know, yeah. so, so, so I think it is a very important aspect that also needs to be picked up and uh, probably needs to be emphasized. Uh, I would like to uh, ask people generally, the, 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 the audience to probably ask questions by uh, either raising their hands and uh, uh, Julie Maxwell will help me in, you know, uh, visualizing people who raise their hands. And of course, yeah, our time is very much limited. I know it is uh, out of, uh, uh, out of, uh, 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 what do I see? Out of uh, what the, the organizers allowed me to just continue allowing me speakers to talk. So, but uh, uh, it's time for question and answer sessions, session for uh, all the four presenters, Brendan, uh, Professor Babakar, Professor Omar, and Professor Ibrahim Abusha. Either comments or questions, although it's supposed to be officially question and answer session, but you know, considering the time, we may want to match the two together. I think for the sake of time, maybe we can just combine the last section with this. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. With you. Open it just I totally agree with you. a few minutes. Yeah, so it's open. Yeah, it's open. But that was just a suggestion. Yeah, yeah, I, I endorse that. Yeah. Now let's go by that. Questions and comments, but please okay. be brief. 
I can start. Can I start? Yes, please, Professor Ungam. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you all. I have learned so much in this uh, conference, and I'm very fortunate to have been able to attend. And uh, thank you all for your wonderful contributions, making me think in new ways uh, that I did not uh, have before joining. A uh, few questions and comments. The first one goes to Brandon. On what, Brandon, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, so one of the clips that you showed yes. of the yes. uh, Sufi dancing, one of them had an AK-47. And I wondered who was that person who had the AK-47 and what is the symbolic meaning of that uh, weapon? Because others had, uh, you know, daggers and other different weapons. Mm -hmm. On um, for Babakar, I'm very fascinated with the continuities and discontinuities that you've talked about of Africanisms, and I, I was wondering if you've looked at in the color form of the writings of enslaved Africans in the Americas, because I have found in one of the documents that uh, Omar Ibn Said wrote that in fact it was English Ajami, not not Arabic. It was it was English written with the Arabic script that he used to write the names of all the family members of Owen, of Governor Owen. Right? And, and even in the Khatims, in the struggle that he was involved, and this is also common in the text produced by enslaved Africans, the Islamic traditions of the Jinn and the Khatim, that knowledge was also used in the struggle in the Americas. Right. So I think uh, there are uh, really possibilities there. And I was wondering throughout your research, whether you have looked at these uh, uh, Ajami and Arabic texts produced by enslaved Africans in the Americas as ways to complement your fascinating work that you have been doing so far. And uh, I would really love to hear your, your points on that and maybe possibilities of collaboration. And finally, to uh, Professor Abu Sharif, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And, uh, and also to Professor Omar Gay, the political dimensions are fascinating and the role of the, uh, uh, the Marabu in uh, uh, serving as uh, social mediators. First for Professor Abu Sharif, uh, I was wondering if you're aware, is he Ira? Is Professor yep. Abu Sharif? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering if you are aware of the conversation that um, Khalifa Nyas has, has triggered recently by arguing that you can marry uh, legally following uh, Islamic law uh, through text. So, so I'm just bringing this through text message and it's in the Senegalese uh, 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 media, it was a subject of discussion. And, and the point here is that could we add another legal dimension right, to this uh, digital uh, 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 aspect that you were talking about? And uh, finally, for Professor Omar Gay, what lessons can we learn from the recent developments of the Sonko affair? And what is the role of the Marabu in uh, stopping the crisis that uh, took place recently in Senegal? Thank you all very much for your wonderful contribution. All right, so do we begin by Brendan? Can you respond to the AK-47 question, the symbolic meaning, please? Very sure. um, I'll be pretty brief because uh, Sudan isn't necessarily my area of expertise. And um, so I can't really speak to what it might mean in a, in a Sudanese context other than what we all recognize, which is that it's symbolic of immense power in a certain kind of way. Um, what I think is interesting about the AK-47 in it is listening to what is he responding to at the times that he fires the AK-47 into the air, right? And, and you can definitely see these, these moments where he's acknowledging the, the ways that people are addressing him through his firing of the AK-47. So symbolically, I can't really say a whole lot beyond what we all recognize, but I think, um, Communicatively, it's it's a very powerful tool as well, right? Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Babaka, do you want to respond to Professor Ngam's? Yeah, 
Uh, I mean, I haven't had a chance, uh, Professor Ngom. I mean, thank you for that very important question. Uh, I haven't had a chance to really um, even encounter, you know, a lot of uh, African American, I'd say, the Arabic writing or uh, writing uh, using the Arabic script. Um, uh, but that is definitely a subject uh, on which, in which I'm very interested. In which I'm very interested, and I and I uh, hope to have the opportunity to explore that with you. So Professor Abu Sharif, what can you say about the uh, suggestion by Professor Paul Ngam about uh, legal dimension of the text? Yeah, well, this is being recorded, right? So I just want to, want to be cautious. That first of all, I am not a Fapi. I, I don't make fatawa and, and this and that, but I, 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 I've heard of that. Uh, and and um, more in the past and also I think more recent, I, I think the question is, can visual media uh, uh, assume that there is there is proper consent and there's no compulsion? Uh, because I think you can decipher that more in person, uh, in an in in-person setting, uh, because <clears throat> it's, um, I think that there, there are probably conditions that would make that, uh, uh, make that, uh, illicit or illicit it depends on i think on context I, again i'm not a fapia i'm not a legist uh but in terms of digital media i'm not surprised by this at all um we have to realize that that uh, digital media disrupted not only the, the the notion of religious authority it has disrupted our even performance our rituals uh, we pay zakat in the phone for example through a phone and this is easy but we don't realize we're performing a pillar of Islam by our phone. There's no connection with the poor people. There's no other connection. So it is a, a, a performance of right on our phone. And also you make hajj, you don't necessarily need mutawa. You don't need someone to lead you uh, in the hajj because you have apps right now who use Google uh, a geo -positioning, positioning to tell you which way to go, where Safa Marwa, where, where the um, Muzdalifa, where's uh, all these other places. And so it, I, I'm not surprised at all that this would happen, but I believe that all the precautions that happen in the pre-digital world needs to be preceded, especially when it comes to a family law, because it can be hurtful and, and can be otherwise abused. So that's my my response, but I'm not surprised. MashaAllah. Uh, okay, Professor. All right. So Professor Omar Gay, the role of uh, Marabut in the recent crisis in Senegal. What can you say to that? Hello, uh, is Professor Omar, yeah, thank you, Falu, for your wonderful comment. So unfortunately, I could not show the picture. I got a PowerPoint with all those uh, illustrations with Sonko, of course. When I talked about uh, the few examples I took, I refer also to this event, this last event. And it worked the same way. The Marabu functioning as a peacemaker peacemaker, but still also controversial, because at the same time, we should have a very, very big rally that Saturday, the last Saturday, all that the civil society movement decided to, to go in the streets, the Marabu asked them to stop. Uh, the, I mean, uh, the caliph uh, of the Murids, Sering Muntaha. And that's because, and that's why they, uh, they did not uh, do the rally. And it is still the same uh, issue. And uh, now it's like uh, we still have uh, a state in the state, meaning that all the decision and uh, what has changed now is before uh, when the former French governor needs uh, the Marabou, he used to call them. But now even the president yeah. goes to Tuba or to Tijuana oh, yeah. to see the Marabu. It means like they got a very powerful, uh, you know, standing now, and they still uh, are the peacemakers. But uh, which side, what is their side? That's the problem. They still do like the others, ask to the activists to stop the movement. That's it. It's not like going to say to the government, so do this, they right, or whatever. It's still in the same way ask to the activists to stop the movement, but still they do have a, a more powerful power so right now. Right. Uh, Masha'Allah, Professor Mohamed Harun. Thanks, uh, 
uh, for your presentations. I just want to, I mean, one has a set of questions for each one, but let me just come to Professor Abu Sharif. Uh, just in terms of religious authority, do you think with the emerging development of digital media that religious authority has weakened rather than strengthened? And on top of that sort of question is that the fact is, has it become more fractured uh, rather than sort of a coalist of sorts? Thank you. Uh uh, thank you for your question. It's a good question, and uh, many people are, um, um, seek to answer that question. Uh, as uh, I mean, the fact that people have access to different points of views is, is actually important. And uh, and it's, but there are the, the perils are are having people who are very good in rhetoric and very good in terms of the style of speech, but yet lack the credentials to to actually speak the way they do. So there is there is. Um, there is that issue with that. And also you have the problem of people um, going to the fatwa buffet. If they look up something and they don't like it, they'll look it up from somebody else. While really fatwa and seeking fatwa should be from someone who knows you and you know that person. And so I think this is one of, one of the issues. In terms of challenging, it's, uh, I think it's, it's a mixed bag. It can be both. I think there are important graces of it. I feel that um, uh, but again, this is just like in the pre-digital age, uh, the cautions of the pre-digital age has transferred in the digital age with, with one minor exception, and that is mobility and privacy is, is very easy. I mean, people may not know what anyone else is accessing in terms of the, what they think is religious knowledge. And finally, the Islamic State or the so-called Daesh, I prefer to say Daesh, uh, they they are, they became very good at using social media for recruitment, and they're making promises, and uh, the promises are not necessarily logical, but they prey on those who are extremely frustrated or poor or whatever it may be. So there is a, a community of ideas and and stresses that are really extra digital, and so I think that uh, it's it's really both a mixed bag. But there are some graces and there are some issues, which is a very political answer. Mustafa, is a Sharif uh, Sharif's hand is up? I I think yeah uh, yeah yeah. Please give him the 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 chance to speak. I had seen uh, Corey, but I mean Professor yeah. Falong, give uh, if you can hear me. Okay, yep, I can hear you. Sharif, so, Sharif, you have the floor. Yeah, give give directive to anyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, thank right. you so much. I will I will keep it short. I know we don't have a lot of time. But um, the, the first thing I, I would like to say again is to, um, to recognize the fact that I am in very good company as, as, as being a, a contributor to this book. And I don't know how um, the marketing is going to go, but it's very important to remind readers that these chapters should not be read individually, that these chapters should be read together because I see a lot of complementarity in the presentations I, I, I have heard yesterday and today, and, and I really want us to emphasize that. Um, one question I have is, I, I have a couple of comments and I have a question for Brendan. I just wanted to, 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 to first of all comment on um, Baba Karmay. Professor May, your presentation was really great. And I would like to, um, Talk about how the, also those subtle influence, those subtle influences of Islam in African American literature. And when you were talking, I had this book next to me, *Song of Solomon* by by Toni Morrison, and um, it, it it just reminded me your your presentation reminded me of those subtle references to to Islam, with the *Song of Solomon* itself, the song where it says in this one stanza. Um, Solomon and Raina, Belali Shalat, Yaruba, Medina Muhammad, Nesta Kalima, Sarak, a cake, 21 children, the last one, Jake. And, and right there, it's just very subtle, but, but Toni Morrison included that reference in, in the song of Solomon that the main character found while trying to, fi to figure out who he was as an African American growing up in a racially segregated United States. But the question I have is for Brandon. Um, did you, uh, Brandon, did you notice any um, 
regional variations in the sounds that you 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 heard in in Senegal. For example, in one of the the, the excerpts you showed, I I kind of could not fail to notice as a, someone from Rifisk and a Lebu that I, I could I could certainly hear the influences of Lebu sound and I wanted to kind of dance to the rhythm also because I heard the Naurabin and, and I really was wondering if you notice any kind of variations in, in how um, those sounds were incorporated in, into the, 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 um, the Islamic songs that you, you, you were able to collect. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting Ringo. question. Um, yep. Okay, that's that's a really interesting question, and um, I think the best I could do is is offer an anecdote or two. You know, of, of course, being in in Medina, there's a there's a heavy Lebu presence there, so um, that certainly comes through in in a lot of the music, and and inevitably in um, some of the the religious music as well. Um, but the kind of thing that I tended to notice more would be, say, if I accompanied the the daira to a retreat, you know, in um, where was I, I think in Dindi Afia outside of Tuba, you know, and and there there would be like an all night session, and there would be a few a few of the local dairas there that that were performing, and then then our daira Diwanu Galas would would put on a performance, and. Maybe this almost relates a little bit to Dr. Abu Sharif's um, paper, but but it seemed to to me that the biggest difference was almost a I don't want to say like a media media savvy, you know, because there wasn't that much media there, but but just something about a self presentation that was a little bit more thoroughly urban and a little bit th more thoroughly connected. Um, seemed to me that that was the biggest um, difference that that I recognized. But um, it's, a, it's a great question, and I think that that kind of comparative study would be would be really interesting to do in Senegal. Thank you very much. Uh, I would really love to allow the floor to uh, for people to keep you know giving comments and, and questions. But you know, due to time constraints, we just have to move to the next part which basically sort of uh, serves as the last part of the program. So Prof Professor Bailo, uh, you have the floor to um, continue, please. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, comments, Professor Correa. Um, yeah, in fact, you know, just like today, earlier, uh, before the panel started, you know, what came to my mind, <laughs> you know, because I was just thinking about the, the types of works uh, that would definitely have a uh, very blatant uh, types of uh, Islamic or Arabic influences, and definitely, and then another for for the reasons that you just mentioned, another book that also came to my mind is Mumbo Jumbo, Ishmael Reed, right? Uh, 1972, a postmodern novel, you know, that takes you to jazz, uh, the Harlem Renaissance, then later on, it takes you to ancient Egypt, to step in uh, Osiris, you know, next you see it takes you to the 1950s, like it moves of context to context and, and has a lot of characters, some of them do have Muslim names, uh, you know, the last of things happening in the Harlem of the 1920s, which we know was very much influenced by Islam, right? Uh, and uh, and then in addition to that, there is of course uh, uh, the Black Muslim tradition, right, in the United States, huh? Including of course the tradition of the Nation of Islam, huh? Uh, Malcolm X's work, Malcolm X's autobiography, that's another example, uh, and and other uh, texts and slave narratives themselves in general, you know, do easily lend uh, to uh, I would say a reading within. American or Islamic context or, or settings, yeah. So I just wanted to say that uh, uh, you 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 cited <laughs> one of the best, you know, and 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 not only that, but Toni Morrison uh, in his other work, right? Even in Beloved, you know, if you look at Beloved, the construction of the characters, and the, the mysticism, right? The mysticism. I think earlier somebody talked about mysticism in Islam. 
Oh, somebody whose name I wrote, uh, I shouldn't forget, uh, Professor, uh, there was a paper. Yes, I think that was Professor Abdullah Uba Adamu, right? He about the shamans, shamans calligraphy, and also like the belief in the talisman, you know, that the amulet will protect you. You know, I mean, the same belief that certain objects, certain pieces of stones, certain things you can use can protect you against harm. It's embedded in African-American culture, uh, especially in the African-American form of voodoo that we know as hoodoo uh, with the H. Uh, um, and also in slave narratives in which a lot of uh, fugitives, like you know, uh, slave runaways had that belief that actually certain things they collected right before they escaped you know, would protect them you know, against uh, the masters, uh, uh, slave ca catchers, you know, and the dogs and, and uh, you know, uh, the overseers, etc. cetera. So, 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 so these are really important elements uh, that cross the Atlantic, right? That's why I think it's important for us to be looking at this subject or, or these questions from transnational cross Atlantic standpoint. And here's where I bring in like some of the works of uh, Charles Pyot, right? Uh, on the Circum Atlantic, which really helps us out. Uh, if I, if I, if, if uh, my mind is correct, isn't Pyot actually a Duke? Yeah. Or huh? either a Duke or uh, a Chapel Hill, you know, I think that's the way he either is teaching or used to teach. I think he Thank is a Duke, brother, I think you're brother, correct. Brother, brother. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the conversation is on ending and uh, it can go on and on and on and on. Okay, but thank but, you. you know, it, it's, it's well, well, uh, very, uh, well, well, thank you. You know, in Senegal, we have, Mbai can be a first name or a last name. So okay. he, his professor, Babakar Mbai, and I am Mbai Lo. Oh. So I don't have a first name in Senegalese culture. I have oh, two last names. So you... That's why when you say bye, he 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 responded. But I'm oh, glad. But I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad he did. So uh, I was tasked with just uh, wrapping it up uh, with few remarks, um, and um, I I am actually very delightful and grateful for the opportunity that has been given to do to host this meeting. There is an Arabic saying that uh, that which you cannot be that cannot be completely attained should not be completely left out. Giving thanks and appreciation in Muslim fiqh jurisprudence belongs to this category. So that is why, as the wall of say, need in Arabic also there is a saying that Man la yashkuri nas la yashkuri la He who does not appreciate his fellow human being will never appreciate the divine. In this context we express our appreciation to Duke Islamic Studies Center to my good friend and colleague Professor McLearney who is here with us and introduced Professor Ngom yesterday morning to Julie Maxwell for sharing her talent, time, and always her smile. To Professor Ngom, Professor Mustafa Urwi for editing this volume. It is not customary in the academia to edit a book of more than 700 pages while maintaining a respectful standard and quality of legibility. There is often a contradictory relationship between quality and quantity, but you have proven the dynamics wrong. One must thank Professor Falula for his generosity in mind and time. We, Africans, I mean, often get lost in the cacophonies of the American academia, in the artificial struggle to be heard, to get fame, money to be promoted. In that process we age, run out of ideas, and thus categorically contribute 
to the demise of the continent. Professor Falula is not. He has successfully maintained both ends of the commitment to scholarship, to global networking. In the name of the organizers, we say Jerejev, Jarama, and thank you. I would like to highlight two areas related to this book, and then I will see the podium for anyone who wants to give a comment or ask a question. The volume is correct in stating that, I quote them, the chapter provides an overview, overview of studies on Islam in Africa, highlighting some hurdle the field faced, the progress made, and the challenges still to be overcome, end of quote. It seems to me that using this argument and reviewing the 33 chapters in this book, the discipline of Islam in Africa has gone through two phases and it is now moving to the third zone that is yet to be identified. If we disregard the colonial era, there was a foundational period in pioneering scholarship of Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa led by Professor John Hanwick and his collaborator Rick Shan of Fahimi. Then 1980s, 1990s work on Sufism, democracy and civil society in Africa led mostly by American Anglophone scholarship that include many of our colleagues who are here today or were here yesterday. Others have passed away and or have retired from the academia. Then now is this phase. It is a, mo a probing move, an atomization of the second phase, led by a diverse group of scholars of diverse background. It seems to me that the difference between this phase and the second phase is methodological. This phase draws on some taste of the age, which is the coloniality in the social sciences and humanities. But it is not yet clear to us how to bring the colonial epistemology to the field of Islam in Africa. Because I guess it is more internal than external process. It is about gender issues, manuscript pride, Muslim beyond the Arab world, as one names the good publication. Beyond Timbuktu, African Muslim bringing Islam to America, new epistemologies and Sufi knowledge, etc. It is about reckoning with colonial legacies, post-colonial inaccuracies, claim in languages and terminologies. However, it seems to me that there is a lingering colonial product and paradigm in this phase, namely our obsession with written sources, literacy. Remember, a major outcome of the European Renaissance tradition was an obsession with writing as the only mode of proper knowledge and modern science as the touchstone of truth. There were liter literate and illiterate traditions and the primacy was given to people with writing system, with a writing system. And those with no writing systems were rendered to a category of people with no history. Implication of this method was manifested on how conquered Africans were priced based on their literacy. The colonial motto goes, as Ampatava reminds us, there is no writing, there is no culture. In this spirit, we all know that the framework that pushed Hegel to state that Africa, I quote him, is no historical part of the world. It is no movement or development to exhibit. Are we internalizing this framework in our obsession with manuscripts and communities with writing in our approach to Islam in Africa? This is a question I'm asking. One should remember Ampatabar's words that in Africa, l'écriture est une chose, et le savoir en est une autre.
the saying goes writing is one thing and knowledge is another writing is the photographing of knowledge but it is not knowledge itself i am glad that some of our colleagues in this Rita is one of them has brought this up in her presentation you must investigate oral history ranging from Nyane to Birago Job's works from collecting new oral tradition and history through interviewing more silent groups and communities the stories of the Tenka in Sudan the Serer in West Africa the Bainuk the, ba the, the Balanta, the Manjuk, and the list goes on. For example, what were their views about the jihad of in, in, in Bundu, in Futa Jalon, in Futa Toro? In Le Mandinke de l'Ouest, Professor Nyan quote some Manjuk song on, the, on their suffering under the Imamate movement of, of jihad. Professor uh, Sheikh Musa Kamara in Aksarul Raghibina Fil Jihad offer a critical assessment of Sheikh Omar Futi, and they are both from Futa. Even concluding that, I quote him, Islam was better under the French administration than that supported Sharia courts than under the jihadi of, uh, and of uh, Sheikh Omar Futi that enslaved Muslims and sold, sold them to the Moor, end of quote. So, a second point that I want to raise in here is because I'm trying to leave some areas here since we don't have enough time is the absence of historical studies in this volume of Africa and Islam beyond the colonial framework most of the studies if not all are confined within the time frame extending from the 16th century but Islam's encounter with Africa is older. Black Africans' contribution and leadership in Islam is much older. There is a lack of in-depth scholarship on black in Arabia and black in early Islamic history and literature, in pre-Islamic -Islam era, in Islam in the life of the Prophet, beyond Bilal, his wife of Egyptian background, his encounter with African musicians at his mosque, his meeting with a delegation of black who came to assist his message. The fact that earlier historians understand his era within the rise of the Ethiopian presence in the Arabia is extremely very telling. This has been framed and should be framed beyond Orientalism, Islamophobia, or Occidentalism. Black were real people in the Arabian Peninsula before the coming of Islam. They were among the knights, the poets, the merchants, the mercenaries, the conquering rulers, and the enslaved Abyssinian. With the rise of new Arab and Muslim empire, black were also among the pioneering pi uh, pious Muslims, believers, and conquering army in Egypt. And in my chapter, I try to talk about this issue, reading traditional texts and how black were represented in the earlier army that conquered Egypt. In this last segment, I am suggesting a new method that could be used to expand the discipline of Islam in Africa. We have learned it from Thomas Kuhn's 1962 book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, that scientific progress is viewed as overcoming old paradigm to a new paradigm. But we are still struggling to figure out what progress means in the humanities, in our field, or in Islam, or let us say in Islam in Africa. There is a great book by a Lebanese scholar, George Trabishi, called Min Islam al Quran ila Islam al Hadith, from the Islam of the Quran 
to the Islam of the Ulama, a beautiful book, a great book, that argues that most of our current Islamic practices and beliefs were actually created by the Ulama in the 8th and 9th century, but not necessarily rooted in the Quran. It is my belief that progress in our field lies beyond exploring the orthodoxy into examining the heterodoxy. Because Islam, as we have it, as we live it, is mostly supporting the orthodoxy. There is a problem with the title of Islam in Africa, and we have seen its manifestations in many of these papers, including Sharif's paper. It, there is a need, when we use Islam in our publication, to qualify it. So as not to mix up between criticism of lived Islam with criticism of Islam. And finally here, in this context, I was talking to Professor Kaita, Sharif Kaita, the other day about what happened between the Cheddo in Senegal and the Bambara in Mali. The Bambara, most of them are still not Muslim. But the Cheddo in Senegal, they are, most, they are all Muslim. And these groups were the warrior class of the Mali Empire. And I was telling him, in my understanding, what happened, the Chiyadda, they got a good deal from Muridia, because Sheikh Ahmad Bambo, <laughs> he told them, Duma Julli, Duma War, Suma Dewe, Dem Ajana. You don't have to pray, you don't have to fast, and if you die, you go to paradise. So they accept Islam. The Bambara were not, they were confronted with the Jihad. And we was telling me, actually, the word Bambara, sometimes, they, most of them say, Bamana which is people who don't believe into God. By God here, he told me, into Islam. So this is extremely important because our colleague Mbai was making a reference to Omar ibn Said. If you look at the text of Omar ibn Said, you have the manifestation of these terminolo terminologies in his wording, when he says the kuffar, the infidel, and the Christian. The Christian is means white. But the infidel in the West in that tradition means basically the Bambara. So these are areas that I think we should look at exploring going forward. That is the third part of the paper, but we don't have enough time to explore it. So I will stop here to reiterate my thanks and appreciation of everyone, including the host, the organizers, and my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just have a few words, uh, maybe two, uh, to thank uh, Duke uh, Islamic Center, uh, Professor Law, uh, Professor Alan McLani, and Julie Maxwell for putting together a wonderful conference all these two days. And to thank uh, my co-editors, uh, Mustafa Kurfi and Oga Falola, and all the authors who have contributed and were patient with the long process we went through. So I'm most grateful and thank you all for your presence. I'm honored. Thank you.